talk to you about this realm of victory and this realm of victory that we live victorious in every area of our life that we conquer and that we master and that we're solid I mean solid as a rock that we're solid and that we're anchored and that we're rooted and we're grounded in the things of the kingdom of God and we don't allow the enemy our adversary the devil who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he can destroy uh, seeing who he can hoodwink and bamboozle and trick and hijack and, 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 and lure into a trap of defeat. I want to get us to a place at Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte that we're solid, that we're anchored, that we're rooted, that we might take a licking, but we're going to keep on ticking. I mean, we might get knocked down. But we're not going to stay down wallowing in defeat, talking about, oh, I'm so defeated. Our life is just jacked up, toe up from the flow up. Oh, I'm not making it in life. No, we're not going to have that mentality. We're going to shift and change our thinking and think victorious. And how we do that is that we're going to have to be rooted and grounded in the things of the kingdom of God. We cannot just be pottered. We cannot just be a surface Christians. We cannot just be one that are shadow. But we have to, our roots in the things of the kingdom of God has to go deep. So I want to minister to you today to help you get your roots deep in the things of God. I want to help you to get solid, strong, and mighty, and courageous so that you can be a, more than a conqueror, that you walk around proud of the fact that Satan is defeated and you're the victor. You won over Satan. You fought a good fight with him and you won. And you understand that the fight is fixed already. So you understand that he's defeated, that he already lost the, the battle. And that you know that you are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You got on the whole armor of God. You stand against principalities and powers and dark and, 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 and darkness and all of the uh, he heavenly hosts is supporting you. And you know that you're more than a conqueror and you walk strong and you walk courageous and you, you walk with your chest stuck out. You walk proudly being a, a king's kid and being one that know God and God knows you. He knows your name. You you and him got a personal thing going on. You got a private line to him. You got a hotline to heaven that you get, you pick up that phone at any time when there's a problem that you need to talk to God and you know he's not going to put you on hold. You know he's not going to not answer you. You know he's not going to tell you, wait, I'm busy. And here, beep, 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 beep. You know that's not going to happen. You know you got a direct line to heaven. Glory be to God. You pick up and dial 1-800-HEAVEN and you know God is right on the other end of that line. So you don't worry about nothing. You're not, you're not concerned about problems and issues and difficult. You know God got you. You know, you, so this is what message I'm going to preach to you today. So you will be solid. I want you rooted and grounded. And I mean, I'm talking about when the storms of life come and the trials of life come and the tests of life come. Boy, they, it's no big deal. You say to the devil, is that your best? Is that your best shot? You got to come up with one better than that to knock me down. Because I know who I am and whose I am. And I know you're defeated. Because my elder brother whooped you. And he said he saw you fall from heaven with like lightning. Bam! <laughs> Amen. He saw you defeated. And so with that, I know that you're defeated. So I'm not taking no stuff from you. You know, that's what I love. You know, uh, I'm sure Dr. Artie, 
you know, with his background and everything, uh, we didn't take no stuff in the street. You know, I mean, so why would we come into church and be wimps? Amen. Why would we come into the house of God and let the devil beat all over up us and come into church talking about, oh, the devil been on my back all week long. I'm so tired of him. I'm so tired of the devil whooping me. No, 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 no. No. We're going to knock you to out. <laughs> Amen. We, we ain't having it. We ain't taking it. Amen. We're fighters. Amen. That's what the streets will do for you. They'll make you fighters. Amen. But then you have to switch sides. If you were a fighter out there in the world, now you're fighting for Jesus. Amen. And so that's what we've done as men of God. And I'm sure some of you women of God, y'all were big time fighters. Probably when the man got, you may got mad at the man, the man mishandled you and mistreated you or something. You cut his tires, <laughs> bust out his windshield, put sugar in his gas tank. Y'all was fighting up a storm. Amen. Then gonna get in the house of the Lord and just be a whim. No, 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 no. That same drive that you had in the world. <laughs> then some of y'all denying it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I know what I'm talking about. Amen. No. Glory to God. So I'm trying to make you fighters today. But fighting for a cause. Fighting for the right purpose. You know, not giving in. Being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So get your Bibles and turn them if you would. And I want to minister this word. I'm, I'm going to entitle this, Are You Planted or Potted? Are you planted or potted? Because all of us know when you're potted in a little plant, you can't grow very tall. You can't grow very wide. You can't grow very big. Your growth is stunted because you're potted. You in this little pot, little small rinky dink pot that uh, this is as far as you're going to grow. Just like knee high to a grasshopper. Not, not at all going to grow with strength and not going to grow mighty and, and, and grow big because you potted. And that's what's wrong with a lot of Christians today. They're potted. And so when you're potted, you know, <laughs> the heat can come. When you're potted and your roots is not deep, you know, the, the heat can come. And I mean, it gets so hot and it burn you up in that little pot. And, and burn your roots up and you just, you wither and you die. And so that's, that's what uh, some Christians uh, 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 are about is being potted and because they don't come to church half the time they don't read their Bible half the time they don't pray half the time they just exist but we want to talk about being planted there's a difference now when you potted you still planted but you just ain't planted right <laughs> yeah you just yeah and, and generally, you're in the window, and you're looking out on things. You know, and you're looking at what should happen, what you'd like to happen, and what you want to happen, but it ain't happening. Because you're just uh, looking through the window in that pot. And so, the one that has potted you have to realize that you're strong enough now to be planted. So they'll take you outside when you're ready. And so today, I want to take those who are potted, I want to take you outside and get you ready, get you planted. I want to get you planted so that you can be like that tree that's planted by the rivers of water. That bring forth its fruit in its season. And leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever you do shall prosper. You shall prosper for the glory of God. So Ephesians chapter 3, when you have it, say amen. 
Let's look at verse 16. Ephesians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. He's writing to them to strengthen them and make them mighty and, and bold and strong. And he says to them, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his inner be, be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that our inner man is strengthened that we're not weak and we're not having that give up type spirit to give up and quit all the time and throw in the towel strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being what rooted and grounded in love may be may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness, woo, <laughs> somebody ought to get excited, that you might be filled with the, with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. The scripture declares, that our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can even ask or think according to the power that's ready to work in you, through you, and for you. You have to be anchored and rooted and grounded so that when you speak and when you declare, when you stand firm in the things of God, uh, when you stand anchored and rooted and grounded, uh, that you speak and declare what's possible, that you're speaking and declaring victory, uh, you're speaking and declaring that you're an overcomer, you're speaking and declaring that you're a conqueror, you're speaking and declaring that you can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. You know that your God is for you. You know your God is on your side, and you know if God is for you, everybody else might as well be. You know if God is for you, who can the world can be against you? You're strong and courageous and bold and mighty because uh, you're anchored and rooted and solid in the things of God. You are solid because uh, your feet are planted on good ground. Reminds me of the story in the Bible. It talks about a man that built his house upon sand. Yeah. Why would he do that anyway? But anyway, he built his house upon sand. And when the storms of life and the storms of, of the storm and the rain and the hurricanes of life and the wind begin to blow, his whole investment just fell apart. He lost everything. His whole house went into the ocean, went into the water because he built it upon sand. It wasn't solid. And that's what we have to do as Christians. We have to build our lives on the solid rock of Jesus. Come on, somebody. And when you build your house, which you are the house, when you build your house on the solid rock of Jesus, when the storms of life come, when the hurricanes of life come, when the difficulties of life come, when the enemy comes in like a flood, when Satan launches an attack, uh, when the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, uh, you are anchored, uh, and you are grounded, uh, and you are planted, uh, and you take a licking, but you keep on ticking. Uh, you don't wash yourself right off into the ocean. Uh, you don't get in there and drown because you can't swim. Uh, you have prepared yourself uh, 
for the evil day uh, when Satan launches his attack against you. Uh, you're mighty and courageous and bold. Uh, when the enemy comes against you to destroy you, uh, you're planted and rooted and grounded in the things of God. Uh, and you stand strong in the liberty where Christ has made you free. Uh, you're more than a conqueror. Uh, you stand mighty and courageous and bold. Uh, oh, because you're not uh, potted. Uh, you're not in a little pot uh, that can't move and spread abroad. Uh, you're not in a little pot uh, that can only go so high. Uh, you're not in a little pot uh, that can wither and dry up. Uh, you're not in a little pot uh, that when the sun comes upon it, uh, it's going to burn it up. Uh, but you are rooted and grounded and you are dedicated for the cause of Christ. Uh, and no matter what the storm comes, uh, no matter the hurricane, uh, no matter what the storm uh, no matter the tornado that come, no matter what the weather deals you, uh, you stand firm because you are rooted and grounded and anchored in the things of the kingdom of God. Can you cut those hands and give God praise? <laughs> you got to be solid. You got to be solid. And that's in your language. See, your language will determine how solid you are. You know, if you're wishy-washy and washy-wishy, and, <laughs> and people talking with you, and, and uh, one minute you want to do this, and one minute you want to do that, one minute you want to be a scientist, next minute you want to be an air, airline pilot, one minute you want to be a, fire to, a fireman, next one you want to be a policeman, then next you want to work in a nursing home. <laughs> you can't do that. you got to settle things. And that's what being rooted and grounded means. You settle. You settle there. You a settler. Okay? You settle in that spot. This is home right here. We're going to park right here. It's in, it's, it's in park. And we parked right here. And this is where we're going to build our empire with God. We're going all high. We're going to build an empire for the glory of God. We're going to build a tower. We're going to build a successful life. Our life is going to just be successful because people are going to see us. And they're going to say, next time they see they say, did you grow a little taller? <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be growing in the things of God. And that's when you are rooted and grounded. And you're being fed the minerals and you're being fed all of the, the nutrition that is available to your spiritual life. See, some of us are starving from now nutrition, spiritual now nutrition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really getting skinny. From not, from not, from not having a good, healthy diet, you know. You, that, you know what I mean. You're not, you're not eating the right foods, you know. You're listening to that junk, and that's feeding you on television and and uh, that social media. My goodness, oh God, you start eat, you start eating up that stuff, boy. You get sick and throw up. <laughs> So much of that filth and so much, unless you, you, you're feeding your spirit man a healthy diet, which is the word of God. And that's what you have to feed yourself, the word of God. And get it from, you got to get the word from your head down into your spirit. You can't just have it in your head. You know, I run into so many alcoholics, drug addicts, prostitutes, and things like that over my lifetime. And uh, when I'm witnessing to them, I'm just amazed. I'll start a scripture and they'll finish it for me. I mean, I'll say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> I go, what? 
for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I go, wow. I get so confused. Because I'm like, if you know that. And the scripture says he didn't know to do good and do it not. To him it is sin. So if you know you're supposed to be doing this word. And you know the word. But see the problem is they got it in their head. And they got to get it 18 inches down into their heart, into their spirit. And that's what people have a difficult time is getting it from their head to their heart. Scientists found out in a recent study, scientists have found out that the, the spirit, that our heart, our spirit has neurons now. And so that should help a lot of people out. Because... They understand that the brain has neurons, that it communicates and, and that kind of thing. But now they find out that the spirit. And so those two are constantly in battle with each other. They're communicating back and forth. And that's why you see people so confused all the time. Because the spirit in the mind is battling the neurons in the spirit and the neurons in the brain. That, you know, they're battling with each other. And there's this is fight going on. And when there's a conflict between the mind and the heart, the heart's going to win. So you got to get everything down into your heart, into your spirit. You can't have it in your head. Head knowledge is not, you know, it's like the letter. The letter killeth, but the spirit is going to give life. Amen. you got to get it down into your spirit where it's part of you. Where when you say you're not going to do something and it's something positive, I'm not doing that, I'm not going to go to church, I'm not going today, but in your heart, your heart is saying, yeah, you're getting ready, <laughs> why are you saying you're not going, I'm, I'm not going, I'm not going, but you're getting ready, your actions, you're getting ready, or I'm not going to tithe it, this money, I'm, uh -uh, I'm not going to give it, and you're writing the envelope out there all the time, you're writing it out all the time, that's the battle between the mind and the heart, and so the heart is going to win. But if you a shyster and you don't want to give no way and he talks to you like that, you shoot, I ain't giving it. No, I ain't getting this money. You ain't going to give it. Okay, because it's not in your heart to give. So in order to, to be a strong and mighty Christian, we have to have things down into our spirit. And we have to be anchored and solid in what we believe and why we believe it. Because see our actions speak louder than words. Our actions, our actions say what we believe. Not what we pretend to believe. See we can make our mouth say anything we want to. But it's our actions that people are reading. People are reading our actions. It's what we're doing. We say one thing a lot of times and do another. That's not being rooted and grounded. But when you're rooted and grounded, the things that you say, they play out. They play out in, in your actions because you're rooted and grounded in the things of the kingdom of God. So in this season, in the, the body of Christ, by large, has to come to a place where they surrender to the Lord and get all of that carnality, that worldliness, that natural thinking, and become spiritual in the things of the kingdom of God and be rooted and grounded in God. Rooted. I mean planted deep where your roots are deep. You know, it reminds me in Florida, we, we lived in Florida for a number of years and uh, we had a tree that was in our yard. And uh, that tree, the roots, begin to spread. When we first moved there, the tree was just a tree planted there and the roots were, were down in the ground. But as life went on, those roots began to spread across the whole yard. And they began to go up under the concrete. And those roots were so deep and so strong 
that they begin to lift the concrete up. They were so strong that they lifted that concrete uh, off, of, off of where it was stationed. It lifted it up. And when we bag out our car, we had to be careful because the concrete had lifted up. And that's the way you have to be in God. Your life has to be rooted and grounded. That your roots are so deep that anything get on top of you and try to stop you, your roots are so deep, it'll push it all away. It'll push anything to try to take control over your life. It'll push it away from your life. It'll give you the ability to take charge over the things that's trying to take charge over you. It'll give you the ability to take the authority over the things that's trying to take authority over you. It will push it and lift it up out of the way. Can you imagine how strong those roots would have to be to lift up concrete? And that's the way we have to be as Christians. Our roots got to be deep in God. They can't be surfaced and potted. They can't be just in a little pot where the enemy can pluck us up at any time. There's some, something can come along, uh, Josh and Shosh can see you in, a, in there. And they can come up there and say, what's this? <laughs> and then they grab it pluck, and pull it right up. But they can't do that to the tree that's planted. Right, that's good. They can't do that to the tree that's anchored and rooted and grounded. Right. So you have to be deep in the things of God yeah. for the glory of God. Amen. Go with me if you would. Psalms 1. Psalms 1, when you have it, say amen. amen. Glory to God. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law does he meditate day and day and night and this causes him in other words to be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit and his season and his leaf shall also not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper when you are anchored and rooted and grounded and like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water, that tree by the rivers of water is getting all the nutrition, getting all the minerals, become a strong tree. And it is so tr strong that it brings forth its fruit in its season. In its season, you are like a tree. And you have to bring forth the fruit in your season. But if you're not anchored and rooted and grounded and not receiving all of the nutrition and all of those things that will help you spiritually, when it's time for you to blossom, when it's time for you to release fruit on your life, the fruit of the spirit, the nine fruits of the spirit, you won't have them. And a lot of times people come to you and they need some fruit. They're hungry and you don't have any faith. You don't have any gentleness. You don't have any kindness. You don't have any other fruit in the spirit on your tree. So they can't get anything off of you. And it was your season to blossom, but you didn't blossom because you wasn't rooted and grounded. But those who are rooted and grounded and the time comes up. And you're in need of some fruit. Huh? And you go to them and you see them uh, and you say, I need a little love. Uh, I've got to pick a little joy off of your tree. Uh, I need a, a, a little gentleness. Uh, I need some of the fruit of the spirit. Uh, and I see you blossoming. Uh, so I'm over there to get some of that love from you. I'm over there to get some of that gentleness. Uh, I'm over there to get some of that kindness. Because uh, you have blossomed uh, in your season for the glory of God. Can you clap those hands and give God praise? <laughs> glory to God. I'm almost done, y'all. I'm almost done. Give me just a couple more minutes. Okay? A couple more minutes? 
Okay. Okay. Jeremiah. Get there real quickly. It's in the Old Testament. Jeremiah. <laughs> 17. When you have it, say amen. Look at verse 7. When you have it, say amen. Look what it says. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope, whose hope the Lord is. Verse 8 says, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out his roots, her roots by the river and shall not see when, it, when the heat cometh, but his leaves shall be green. Wow. You don't see the enemy coming and the enemy comes, but it don't matter. Still going to blossom. Glory be to God. Amen. And shall not be and shall not be careful in the year of the drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. No matter what. No matter what happens. No matter what the enemy throws. No matter what you face. No matter what trials, no matter when the enemy comes in and steals from you, when the enemy takes from you, when he robs from you, no matter what, you are still going to prosper. You're still going to be blessed. You're not going to be discouraged. You're not going to give up. You're not going to quit. You're still going to yield fruit. You're still going to be excited. You're still going to be ignited. You're still going to be enthused. You're still going to be infused. Because it's not based upon your emotions. It's based upon you being rooted in the things of God. Amen. When that girl break your heart, that, don't, that ain't nothing. <laughs> that girl break your heart, that's all right. Shoot, nah. man, you said there's more fishes in the sea. Glory to God. But this time I'm fishing in this pond over here. <laughs> Or when that man mishandle you and mistreat you, you don't say, I ain't never getting a boyfriend again. I'm going to get me a woman. <laughs> you don't talk like that. You don't talk like that. You realize, hey, that's just the wrong one. But uh, there's the right one here because I'm going to blossom regardless. I'm going to prosper regardless. I ain't going to have them trick me. Hey. Have me to go for the okie doke. <laughs> Look what it says. Verse 9. Verse 9 says, The heart is dis deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know how wicked we can become? Unless we're rooted and grounded. Because when we're rooted and grounded in the things of God. That wickedness from Satan and demonic activity can't take root in our life. And bitterness and resentment and anger can't take root. It can't live in the same space. Fear and, and love can't live in the same space. Fear and bitterness can't live in the same space. So when you're rooted and grounded in the things of God... Demonic activity can't now live in that same space. Amen. When you're rooted and solid and anchored, they may try to infiltrate the camp. They might try to ambush you. They might try to sneak surprise. <laughs> but because you're anchored and rooted and grounded, you're going to blossom anyway, the scripture said. Let's go last scripture and I'm done. Well, I'm not even going to even turn there. Psalms, Psalms 92, for the sake of time. I'm out of time. Psalms 92, 12 says that we'll flourish like a palm tree. The scripture says that the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. 
The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. What's the deal with the palm tree? The palm tree is the most unique tree in the world. It is different from any tree you ever seen. There's something so different and unique about a palm tree than any other tree. You have been to Florida. I know Verdell went with us and she's seen palm trees. And Brenda Campbell, I know she grew up in Florida for a while. And so and some of you, I'm sure, have been to Disney World and you've seen those palm trees. But you also seen, I'm sure, during hurricane season, you've seen on the news where the hurricanes are coming. Oh, and also Rodriguez, he's very familiar with palm trees from Miami. <laughs> the scripture says that you'll flourish like a palm tree. Okay, so let me tell you what's up with the palm tree. The palm tree roots are so deep that when the hurricanes come, that those, those, those trees, those palm trees, they will bend, but they will not break. I don't care. Those winds are going 140 miles an hour. And if you look at it when during the news about the hurricane, that palm tree is bending all the way over to the right. Whichever way the wind is blowing, it's bending, it's bending. And as long as that wind is st still coming, it's going to stay bending. And I'm sure the palm tree said, I wish you would hurry up and pass on by and go to the next city or the next state so I can straighten back up. But it's going to bend, but it's not going to break. So the scripture says if you plant it like a palm tree, that unique tree, then you will take a licking and keep on ticking and you will bend, but you won't break. Uh, when the enemy comes in and begin to attack you, you all you're going to do is bend over like this here and wait for the, it to cease. And when it cease, you stand straight back up and start grinning and smiling and enjoy the sunshine and say, hey, I, I weathered the storm. I'm here to declare to you today uh, when you're rooted and grounded uh, you can weather the storm uh, when you're rooted and grounded you can stand still and anchored and be grounded in the things of God when you're rooted and grounded like the palm tree you might bend but you're not going to break Satan is not going to break you he might cause you to bend but you're not going to break uh, you're going to weather that storm and when that storm is over you're going to get back up strong mighty and courageous and ball and tell the devil nah, 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 nah. you lost stand to your feet Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Hall Walker what a joy it is to come to you by way of television and share with you journey to greatness broadcast if we're being a blessing to you would you be so kind to consider going to our website FWC Charlotte and consider giving a generous gift so we can continue the ministry we're touching lives around the world and you can partner with us and help us make a difference. Thank you so very much for your support and wish God's very best to you. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah. I want to minister to you a word that I believe will impact and empower and change your life forever. Because I'm convinced that God wants the body of Christ, not just Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte, but I believe this message is for the body of Christ. Because it's time for us to take a check up from the neck up and stop that stinking thinking and allow God to do what he wants to do in our heart and in our life. So I've entitled this message, God is recalling you. God is recalling you. You've already been called. You remember the day that you accepted the Lord as your personal savior and you said, Lord, I'm yours. I go where you want me to go. I say what you want me to say. I do what you want me to do. I'm submitted. I surrender to you my all in all. And then what happens is as life journeys on and as we go through life, storms and trials and difficulties and tests, and the issues of life begin to overtake us. 
They begin to bombard us. They begin to get us down and out. They begin to cause our anointing to wane. And, and we begin to leak. The Holy Spirit begins to leak out of our life. And we get away from the things of God. We get away. We start concerned about more about the things of the world and survival. We put ourselves in survival mode. Fear. And fear has torment. And we're afraid of this and we're afraid of that. We're afraid the enemy is going to come in and, and, and destroy us at any, any moment. We don't walk by faith like the word of God says. The scripture says to walk by faith and not by sight. We're not to have our eyes on the circumstances in the situation. We're to have our eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ, the anointed one and his anointing. So this message this morning, God is recalling you because we all have all been called and we all picked up the phone and we answered the phone. We answered the call. And we accepted the Lord as our personal Savior. And we asked God to come into our heart. We asked him to forgive us and wipe our slate clean. But I believe today God is recalling you. I believe today that, today that God is recalling you. Because once you've been called, you got to be recalled. And when you are being recalled, some of us won't pick up the phone. Some of us won't answer. Some of us, the line is busy. Some of us are too busy to answer the call. Some of us don't want to answer the call. Some of us are not going to answer the call. Some of us are thinking about whether you should answer the call. Some of you are so stubborn, I'm not answering the phone. Let it ring. And God is calling you. He's recalling you to a place and a space of a new beginning. The former things of things, the former things are behind. And God wants to do a new thing in your life. God wants a fresh anointing to fall on you. God wants a new awakening in the spirit realm for your life. He wants you to Get a hold to a hunger and a thirst after him. A desire that you have within your spirit, that's in your heart, that you say, God, I need you. God, I'm depending upon you. God, I'm trusting you. God, I'm leaning to you. God, you're my everything, God. I worship you and adore you. I'll magnify you. I'll lift you up. I'll give you glory. I'll give you praise. I will magnify you today and the very demons and devils that that's coming my way, they'll fall powerless because of the anointing and the anointed one that's in my life that sustains me, that I walk with, that I talk with, that I fellowship with, that knows me by name. And when he calls my name, I pick up the phone and I answer the recall and I'm ready to go where God wants me to go. I'm ready to say what God wants me to say. I'm ready to do what God wants me to do because God is all in all in me. Can somebody clap those hands and give God praise? So Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Each, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. Saints of God, the glory of God has been released upon the body of Christ. But we have to put our spiritual antennas up. 
We have to connect to the glory of God that's been released in the world. But the interference is from Satan, our adversary, the devil, who hinders us, who is seated in high places, blocking us and hindering us from receiving the blessings of the glory of God. And you have to break through demonic activity. You have to break through demons and devils that's, that's in the heavenly realm. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the glory of God has been released to the church and it has been released to your life. The glory of God that any time that you get a call from God and any time God speaks to you, you got to pick up that phone. Uh, you got to pick up the phone and accept the recall that he's dialing your number, that he's pushing your buttons, uh, that he's calling you by name. And you got to answer that recall and you got to say, Carter, here I am. Uh, I'm yours. God uh, and I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to be committed and I'm going to hear your voice and quit, quit listening to that, that voice in your head that voice in your head that's always speaking that voice in your head that's already always listening because there's a voice in your head that's already always listening to the voice in your head you got to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and you got to bring it into captivity you got to take the captive uh, of the voices in your head that's telling you don't pick up that phone don't answer it he's gonna tell you something that you don't want to do he's got a plan that you won't like you remember when he came to you last time you remember how hard that challenge was? You remember how difficult that was? Don't, don't do it. Don't accept the recall. Don't buy into the recall. But I'm here to tell you today, when you buy into the recall, when you accept the recall, there's an anointing that comes with that recall that empowers your life to live life powerfully, to live life on purpose, and to live life intentional. If you pick up that phone and answer that recall and get your marching orders, get your assignment that God has downloaded to your spirit and you upload it to your spirit as he's downloaded it to your heart, you grab a hold to that and you run the race Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured. So you're going to have to endure tough, tough times. Yes, it's sometimes fearful to pick up the phone because you're afraid of what's going to be on the other side of that call. Sometimes it, it makes you nervous uh, because you don't know uh, who, who it is. So, so better just let it go to the voicemail. Let it go to voicemail because of the fear that it's going to cause responsibility. And one of the things about being a, a Christian, we have learned that one of the things you must do is be responsible, be reliable, be dependable. I'm amazed at how many Christians have the title of Christian, but yet they don't honor their word. That's why I say I'm not a Christian. I'm a disciple of the Lord. A disciple is a learner. One that is learning. One that is growing. One that's ready to be taught. The disciples, they were learners. They were disciplined learners. They come, this, uh, disciples come from the word discipline. They were disciplined learners learners and we have to be disciplined learners to learn and develop and to grow into the things of the spirit but unless we answer the recall unless we pick up the phone unless we allow God to speak to our hearts we're going to stay just like we are you'll never grow as long as you 
run from the call. Dr. Bedella ran from the call at a, at a young age. She ran from the call for various reasons. But finally, she came to herself and she answered the call. And look how God has made her great because she answered the call. Don't deny the call. Don't block the call. Because some of us block the call. Oh, no. God's calling. <laughs> block. <laughs> uh-uh. No, 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 no. Can't reach me. Because that's going to bring about responsibility. I'm going to have to do something. I got enough on my plate. I'm doing too much as it is. I can't. Uh-uh. God, no, 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 no. I'm busy. I'm busy and I'm busy. If you if you too busy, you too busy. <laughs> if you too busy for God, you too busy. You can't be too busy for for the one, the manufacturer who created you, who designed you. And if he wants to recall you back to himself because he needs to do some work on you, then be willing to let him do the work. I just got a notice this week that my 2021 Explorer has a recall. They're recalling it back to the factory for whatever reason. I didn't get a chance to read why, but they're recalling it, they're recalling it back to make some adjustments on it. And that's the same way with God when he calls us, when he recalls us. He's only calling you back to make some adjustments on you. To fix some things that's not working properly. To fix some things that, that, that needs to be dealt with in our life and in our heart. He's calling us back because he wants to do some things in our heart. So the manufacturer who is heaven will recall us. But we like, oh, I ain't, I ain't, I'm not. I'm not mm. If I don't, look, if I don't honor that recall. And then I'm on the expressway somewhere. And the car break down, what are they going to tell me? You should have answered the recall. <laughs> you should have contacted us so you could be scheduled for the recall. So thanks this morning, you need to schedule your time for the recall with God. Because God is calling you. Schedule a time with him with the recall and say, God, I'm coming back home. God, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back for you to examine and check out things. This malfunctioned in my life. Because a lot of us have had a lot of malfunctioning in our life. A lot of us have had things that just went haywire. Maybe some wire could, uh, misconstrued us. Maybe, maybe we need an oil change because our oil of the anointing is dirty and then you need to oil change or maybe there's a, a hole in your oil filter or your oil because everything with the anointing comes upon you and we can leak out of that anointing if it's a hole in our heart because we can put that anointing in and then and then all of a sudden it can you can knock a hole in it or somebody can knock a hole in it and you don't go to the manufacturer who is God to have him to fix it. And you going around in life with a hole in your anointing. You going around in life and that's why you're miserable. That's why your life is jacked up, toe up from the flow up. That's why you're not smiling. That's not why you're not, you're not excited. You're not ignited. You're not enthused and you're not infused because somebody knocked a hole in your oil. And you need to honor the, the recall and go back and let yourself be fixed by the manufacturer, which is God. Need to go back and let him patch up that hole where all the anointing that leaked out and, and, and you're miserable and you're operating in, in, in you're operating uh, on the on the on the on the on the, res, on the uh, residue of what you had. You're operating on the residue and you're barely making it. Dr. Bedella was talking about how her blood level was so low she was operating 
on a low residue of her blood and didn't know what was wrong. Sometimes we don't know what's wrong, but if we would honor the recall, God is recalling you today. He's calling you to the manufacturer. He's calling you to heaven. He's calling you to connect with him. He's calling you to meet with him and work out some issues and problems that you've gone through in life that you've been holding on for years and years and years. The hurt and the pain of the difficulty that only God and his anointing can heal. It's time to go to the throne of grace and obtain mercy in a time of need because the glory has been released to the world has been released to you God has given you everything you need to walk in victory to walk in power to walk in authority to walk as an overcomer to walk strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because you are not going to be defeated by Satan you're going to walk in victory you're going to walk strong you're going to walk mighty you're going to walk courageous you're going to walk bold and you're going to walk as an overcomer and no demon and devil and nothing's going to stop you from your recall can you clap those hands and give God praise so look at Isaiah so Isaiah says then said I woe is me whoa I'm jacked up he came to the reality. But some of us won't get present to how jacked up we really are. We hide behind a false sense of trying to show people or make people think we got it all together. And we do that, we mask that by, by our attitude and uh, put on a front. We front. And won't, won't let people know the real you. Some people don't know the real you. Because you mask yourself so well. You hide yourself so well. You're not transparent. You're not free. You're in bondage. And that bondage can stem from way back in your life. It can stem from... Trump, you were traumatized as a kid. It could have been a divorce between mom and dad. It could have been your brother or sister who molested you. It could have been anything that you still are traumatized about. And it happened 30 years ago. And, and God's been recalling you to heal you of the pain to fix the pain, to deliver you of the pain, to make you free of the pain, but you won't pick up the phone. You won't answer the recall. Because it, you know why you don't answer it? You don't answer it because it made a friend to you. It made a friend. You, it became your buddy. Your ace boon coon. Your road dog. And, and, and it's, it's so part of you, and you need it. You need it to depend on because it builds and validates your weakness. It affirms you as being a weak person. You affirmed. Poor you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the pity party is on because that's what keeps us alive. Some people are, are, are just addicted to chaos, addicted to problems, addicted to, to difficulties. And if life was to, to work for them, they wouldn't know how to work life. Because they won't answer the recall. They avoid the recall. But look at my dear friend, uh, and I call him a friend, because he's, he's impacted my life. This is my ace boon coon. 
Look at Isaiah. Isaiah says, woe is me, for I'm undone. In other words, he said, I'm undone. I'm not complete. I, 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 I'm not finished. And most of us are not complete. We're not living life whole and complete. Saints, Christians, disciples, learners, you got to live life whole and complete. What does that look like? That looks like you're not intimidated by no demon and devil and no circumstance. And no, whatever happens come your way, it will not overtake you. I don't care what it is. I love my mama to death or to life. But if she went on and be with the Lord, life has to go on. And I will miss her, but I'm going to Focus on the fond times we had together. The fond memories of how when my life was messed up and how she was there. How when I wouldn't answer the call, I refused to answer the call. I wasn't picking up that phone. I refused to pick up the phone. But after much counsel, I answered the call. And so I remember the fond times that we had together. And I'll always rejoice and remember, though, it's not going to take me under. I'm not going to die. But rather, I'm going to rejoice. It's a celebration. My mom has lived to be 92 years old. And if she see 93, which I know she will, because I'm getting her to 100. <laughs> Come on, give the Lord a big hand of praise. Because I want to encourage her like I've been counseling with her about the recall. And about working things out in her life. My own mom. Counseling with her about issues and problems and difficulties that she's faced. And, and giving her counsel in how to overcome. My own mama. That's because I answered the call. I'm God's man. And I'm proud to be God's man. And I'm proud to live life whole and complete. I don't have those issues. I can't say that. I couldn't say that years ago. It was a journey to my greatness. It was a journey to my greatness. That I had to master me. I had to pick up the phone, but you know what the difference in me and a lot of people? I was always picking up the phone, always answering, always answering, always answering, always answering. Yeah, God, <laughs> what do you say? Oh, no, God. Oh, God, I'm trying to, Lord, I'm doing my best. What'd you say? Okay, God. No? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh huh? Oh. What do you want me to do? You really want me to do that, God? Oh, God, come on. Please, give me a break. Huh? If I don't do it, you're going you're gonna to do what? <laughs> Okay, God, I'll do it. <laughs> God, man, I ain't answering that phone next time. But, but next time the phone rings, I answer it. Every time I'm answering the phone. Because God is recalling us. He's recalling you. Pick up the phone. Don't dodge the phone call. Here's a man says, I'm a, look, at, look at me because, I, look, I'm not whole and complete because I am a man of unclean lips. I'm a, I curse all the time. I cuss folk out. Every time I see him, I blank. <laughs> I cuss them out. Every, you know, uh, my lips are unclean. 
And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So they're cussing me out too anyway. I, I'm not just cussing them out. They're cussing me out. So fair exchange is no robbery. They're cussing me out, God. So I got the right to cuss them out too. <laughs> For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He says, I have seen the glory of God. So that's going to transform me because I answered the call. When the recall came to my life, I picked up the phone and I saw angels worshiping him. I saw angels that were just saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And the glory of God, I'm surrounded by the glory of God. And the doorposts began to move. Things began to shift. My whole world was turned around when I picked up the call. So he says here, and I love it. He says, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. I visit the presence of God. I'm in his presence. Now everything is being x-rayed in my life. And when you pick up the phone and answer the recall, God's going to x-ray your heart. He's going to x-ray you and it's going to be like the Psalm of David. David said, search me, Lord, and see if there be any wicked thing in me. Search me. Check me out, God. You deal with the, the, the issues in my life. And you cleanse me, O oh Lord, he says. And this is what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah is, is making it very clear that the presence of God, the glory of God, the recall in his life has impacted him to an awesome degree. Then he, look at verse 6. He says, and then flew one of the seraphims unto me. One of the angels came and flew to him. Having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the thorns from off the altar. Here's the angel went, grabbed a hot coal, burning hot coal off the altar. And look what he did. And he laid it upon my mouth. Burned all that impurity up. All that lying and cussing and carrying on. We need to have God, the angels, to bring a hot coal to our hearts and our lives and deal with some of those issues that we have that we're holding on to. That's making our life miserable, making us so, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Bedella will tell you, I wake up ignited, excited, enthused, and infused because I'm anointed and appointed. I wake up, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. That's how I wake up. Listen. <laughs> this is, when I wake up in the morning, this is a day I never seen before. I never seen when I wake up. I didn't see this day. This is a new day. Brand spanking new. And I know God got something for me. I'm like a kid on Christmas morning. Amen. I got some toys coming. I got some gifts coming. I got something coming. And I'm not a taker. I'm going to give something too. I went out. I was proud yesterday. I went out and uh, to support uh, Project 704. And they asked, would you support all the booths? They asked everybody. 
But when you're talking to a crowd, you're talking to me too. When I'm talking to a crowd, I'm talking to every one of you. So I went to every booth and supported. No, I'm lying. I went to most of them. I, I got to one booth, and she said, I said, what, what, what do you have? She said, I got adult toys. <laughs> I said, well, that's pretty nice. Um, all right. <laughs> so... So I wiggled my way out of that one. <laughs> but my point I'm trying to make this morning is that when you're living life powerfully, okay, you give and you receive. It's more blessed to give than receive. When, 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 when you're living life powerfully, you want to give, you want to be a blessing. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, let me wrap this up. I'm time getting away from me. So, so our, our dear brother I, uh, Isaiah, look, look, look what he says, okay, and I, I'm going to expedite this thing real quickly now, accelerate. So, he says, um, verse 7, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, lo, he has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sins is purged. That was a great day for him. He answered the call. And look at the benefit. His sins were taken away. His iniquities. Iniquity is, is lawlessness. It was taken away from him and purged out of his life. Verse 8 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord. God will speak to you when you allow him to purge you. When you allow him to, to uh, purge you and you answer the call. Look what it says. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I. He answered the call. Here am I. Send me. And he said, go and tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. You see indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of the people fat. And make their eyes heavy and shut off their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Take this message to my people, he said. And he was a volunteer to see, I am it. Why? He answered the call. Now he's ready to volunteer. And now he's used mightily of the Lord. And he was so anointed, he wrote more about Jesus' coming than any other prophet. He wrote about Jesus coming. Why? Because he would accept the call. God would have called somebody else if he didn't. He would have called somebody else. But because Isaiah would always answer the phone. He always picked up the phone. When he got a phone call, he answered. And so that's why he had more revelation as a prophet than any other rest of them. You know, some of them said, mm-mm, I ain't answering. <laughs> Look at Pastor Moses. He refused to answer the call. God had to make him and compromise with him. You know, he had to compromise. Well, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what. I'll send you and your brother go. Is that all right? Tell you, send you some company. And he said, okay, I'll go. But he didn't just willfully go when he got the call. He had to compromise with God. God, you got to give me somebody that's going to talk for me because when I get to uh, opening up my mouth, I'm nervous. Now. <laughs> <laughs> So send me my brother, let him go with me, and uh, we'll be all right. And so we sometimes want to compromise with God. That may be his permissive will, but that was not his perfect will. 
Pastor Moses was supposed to pick up that call, answer, and when he said, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him to let my people go, I'm on my way. <laughs> and that's what we must do as believers, disciples, learners. When God called, we pick up the phone, and we answer, and we get our marching orders, and we say we're on our way. Count on me, it's done deal. All right, let me wrap this up. Go with me. To Lamentation. Don't turn there because you'll never find it. Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 20. And Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 20. Look what it says. My soul has them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Stand to your feet. Fantastic. Yeah. We're excited. We have about what? I guess about five minutes. No, it's a little bit more. About five minutes before midnight. And we want to wish all of our fans and friends and family a happy new year. Thank you for your support. We're so thankful for the FWC Community Development Center. And uh, we want to thank uh, my awesome wife, who's the uh, instructor of Cornerstone Christian University doing a great job and as you all know I'm the senior pastor of Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte and we just moved we're in our new location and we're really excited aren't you excited about the studio audience I want to thank you for tuning in to Journey to Greatness broadcast with Dr. Randall and Bradella Hall Walker. Well, now I, I got to say Dr. Bradella Hall Walker. Yes. She received her honorary doctor's degree, and now she's studying to get her earned doctor's degree. Let's give it up. I am so, I'm so just, oh, just so amazed. I, you're my darling, darling. Ooh, I forgot I'm on Christian television. Ooh, but this is my darling, darling baby, my sweetheart, and I'm so grateful for her and the growth and development that we have shared in our marriage. We've been married 34 years. So that's why we call this program Journey to Greatness Broadcast. And so thank you for joining in with us. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Journey to Greatness Broadcast. And you, you can watch us on social media. You can watch us on Twitter, Instagram. We're all over there. We just, because we're very social people. And thank you for connecting with us. Thank you for responding to us. All of your letters and emails that come in, we're grateful. We're thankful. We don't take that for granted. And we answer those personally. It's not that someone else is answering them. Yes, we at one time we did have some folk answering it, but we answered those personally. So if you want to get in contact with us, by all means do so. Just want to tell you a little bit about our new location. We're at 301 North Pine. Uh, oh, excuse me, 301 North Polk Street, right, in Pineville, North Carolina. It's Pine and no place else. <laughs> We're excited about it. We have expanded and grown. And it's amazing how during the pandemic, mm. when all hell has been breaking loose, God just has supernaturally yes. blessed us. Yes. And we're just so grateful during the midst of crisis. Mm. Tell us, uh, the, the audience there, tell them and also those who are watching by social media, some of the experiences that we've had uh, transitioning from our old location into our new location, mm -hmm. how the landlord and everything was so gracious towards us. And uh, just bless the viewers, will you? Hello, everyone. It was just a pleasure 
we were uh, moving forward in the new year, looking back at 2020, all the things that were taking place. And little did we know we were going to have to move. Uh, we were settled into Old Pineville Road and just enjoying uh, the teaching, enjoying the, the classes, enjoying the place. And then all of a sudden, this COVID-19 hit shut us down from the plays and different other things but the ministry continued we still had service every sunday we even incorporated a drive-in church where yes. people could sit in their car sit under the tents as the weather permitted and then the classes continued we were able to be blessed with with awesome finances to continue with the the school continue with the community center Every Thursday, we were passing out food, ten, sometimes 10 families, all the way up to 25 families. Yes. We were able to pass out food all over the Charlotte area. And then all of a sudden, we get a letter from our landlord telling us that they want to expand their building. And we're like, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? Right before you share this story, I want to rewind just a little bit to uh, how God was just awesome during the pandemic when it hit, we were essential because we had the FWC Community Development Center where, where God shut the whole church down. And if you weren't essential, you, you were out of business, so to speak. But we were in business. We were helping individuals with food and, and people who were stranded. Uh, we were helping individuals, elderly couples and, 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 and elderly people with food and, and distribution and just reaching out to the community in an awesome way during the pandemic. And so on Sunday, we would have uh, 10 in our sanctuary. We would only have 10. We honored that. But we had what was called the drive in church that my wife talked about, where you could drive your car in and uh, we where you could get out and sit in the wonderful tent. You remember R.W. Shambach back in the day used to have tent tent revivals where we would have a tent out there. You could sit under the tent. And if you didn't like the, the uh, old fashioned uh, tent, you could sit in your car. And we had 87.9 uh, on, we had a radio station, or we still have it, 87.9 on your FM station. Now we're serving Pineville, all of Pineville in South Char Charlotte, on our radio station so tune in and check us out if you would at 87.9 fm and that is also during the greatness broadcast so we're excited so out of that pandemic some great things happened we developed a radio station out of that we were able to touch lives the social media mm -hmm. was at an all-time high connecting with individuals uh overseas uh, uh india africa and um um um, the wonderful people in Pakistan just reaching out to the world. So in the midst of a crisis, you know, there became opportunity. And that's amazing, you know, that in the midst of a crisis, we can switch that. And I want to tell you who are watching me right now by way of television, social media, however you're watching me, you can, in the midst of a crisis, you can turn it around for an opportunity. I believe that with all my heart. But I want my wife to pick up uh, the story there for after we transition into our new building because we got about five about five more minutes before the countdown and we're going to count down for the new year all right you know the word of god says all things work together for good to those who love the lord and it is it is really true a lot of the people see the COVID as and it is sad in a way for the different lives that were lost and those who were sick and those who suffered but even in that, the word of God says all things, all things, even the pandemic or storms, what it works together for the good. Yeah. And for that, God, I always said how God just came in underneath that and allowed us to do more than we could have ever done without it. And so we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for our supporters. We're grateful for those intercessors, those who've been praying for us, family members. We are so grateful. And, and I'm excited about the fact, as I was sharing, how uh, the pandemic had come in, but we were still able to give out food. And then we get the notice for the landlord telling us they want to expand. We're like, oh, boy, <laughs> what do we do now? And so we had to hold on to the word of God. Yes. We had to hold on to our faith. And one of the things I share 
on our prayer line is that we always send our faith out. Send your faith out first and you go behind and you handle and you walk into your faith. Send it out. So we had to send our faith out first that God was going to give us a new place. God was going to uh, help us walk into prosperity everything that we needed. And so it was so funny how we had so many people looking for buildings for us. And we were also looking as well. And then one night we just happened to be out. We had actually seven, <laughs> seven uh, realtors looking for us. Right. Seven realtors looking for us a building. And uh, we ended up finding we a building ourselves. We found it. And then <laughs> we we were able to work with one in particular, and the building was an uh, empty shell. I wish we could show you the pictures of how the building was just empty, over 4,000 square feet. And if you were to see it now, so what you can do, though, is go on Facebook and look at either the virtual tour that we did or the pictures that we put up and just see how amazing this building was transformed yes. from being just an empty shell to a beautiful place for Cornerstone Christian University, for the FWC Community Center, for uh, we have a <coughs> huge stage for the Unique Youth School of Acting where yes. we are going to pick up our acting uh, in 2021 for uh, worship, for our office. We Amazing. even have uh, an area for our office. It's just so amazing what God has done. And we, mm. we just we just know that this is just the beginning. Yes. This is just the beginning. Our best days and, are ahead. And I am so excited about where we're going, how we're going to get there, and how God's going to supply every need once we're there. So we're excited. We're running out of time. We're almost at that almost point. Almost there. Let's see. We and look so like we got about a couple of minutes. Two minutes. And wow. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm excited for all the members who, who supported us and, and ran yes. around looking and have come in and decorated and beautified. Yes. We it, beautified the building to make everything work. And so it's functional. We're working. Everything's going well. And we're just excited about what's going to happen well, listen, for the next year. Listen, before I, before we uh, get to the countdown, i got to tell our viewers how our landlord blessed us. Because what happened was, when we got to notice, quite naturally, uh, we found a building and, and you told that part. But it was amazing that we didn't have the men that was needed to move all of our stuff to our new location. The landlord was gracious enough to send his team mm -hmm. with us to move our things, take them out of the building and help us to take them to the new building. That was an, uh, yes. amazing. That's not all. Then he was so gracious. He said we could have all of the cabinets. You see, the, that was my cabinet over at, at the old building. You might say, man, you're still in your old building. No, I'm not. That's the cabinet from our old building. Gave us all the cabinets. Yes. And guess what? Also gave us the kitchen sink. <laughs> and, so and, 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 and gave us a, uh, a stove and just blessed us so tremendously. Blessed. Yeah. I, it was the first time I've seen... Uh, God moved in such a uh, quick and a fast way. And listen to this. When we got to our church, we couldn't put up all of the the the, uh, the uh, shelves and the and all of the fixtures and the plumbing and the electrical work that needed to be done. God sent us faithful people. It was amazing. I was in awe. At, on a Sunday morning, we said we were going to have a worship service, and then we're going to work. And we teamed up with uh, another church that came over with us, that meet with us as well. And they came, and the group of men and all got, got together. And I was in awe <laughs> at how quickly they were able to renovate this place. Yes. And all I had to do was speak the word. That centurion, he didn't have nothing on me. You remember the guy said, I, I say to one to go, and he goes. I say one come, and he come. I said, put that cabinet over there. That one goes over there. This goes over here. We're going to build a wall here. We're going to build a wall there. <laughs> and when I spoke, my words came to a reality. 
And I said to myself, that's the way it's supposed to yes. be. When you speak and declare, it's supposed to happen. You're not supposed to speak and it not happen. And I actually seen when my words have power with man. And let me tell you something. When your words have power with man, they have power with God. And when they have power with God, they have power with man. Okay. Oh. We're on a countdown. Oh, yeah. Oh. All right. Countdown. Stop 30 seconds. All right. Here we go. 10, 10 9, 9, 8. eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Yes. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Happy New Year. Listen, this is going to be the greatest year of your life. I believe that with all my heart. This is the year yes. of perfection, and this is the year of maturity. So you're going to grow and develop and to perfection, and it's going to be a year of prosperity for your life because God is going to do great and mighty things for you. So I'm so excited for yes. you doing this new year as we have transitioned into a brand new year, a fresh start. Hit the restart button. It's a new beginning. Put away the old, let the old be done away with, let the new come, let this be a great year. Whatever your baggage was last year, drop, drop it, it off, <laughs> send it forth, and let, let it, it go. go. And start all over again. Yeah. Uh, don't, I don't want to hear that song, starting all over again, it's going to be rough. I don't want to hear that song, okay? I want to hear uh, that song like, ain't no stopping us now. We're on the move, okay? <laughs> All right? Because this is a new year. This is a new year for you. Celebrate good times. Cele hey, I like that. That's celebrate good time. Come on. Come on. We got to <laughs> celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. What an awesome time that we can celebrate him a new year. This is the greatest day of our life, yes. and we got to yes. live like it. We got to live life powerfully, live life intentional, and live life on purpose for the glory of God. So I want to thank you so much for joining in with us. And please call us. You can reach us at 704-322-8010. But we got a few more minutes left. Uh, so we're going to talk to you about a few things in the new year. And I want to wish all of my family and all of my friends a happy new year. Uh, if I start calling out, I miss somebody, so I'm just going to say, hi, Mommy. <laughs> oh, I thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> but I do want to give a shout-out uh, to, to uh, my grandkids in Florida and my son. I'm really excited about them and what they're doing, and I'm just so grateful for them. And Annie Walker, my mom, who is an extraordinary lady, she turned 90 years old this year. 90 years old. Yes. Wow, that's awesome. Yes, yes. So we're so grateful for her. And uh, thank you. Annie Walker lives in Detroit. And I'm hoping to get her down here soon. But I want my wife to name all of, of the grandkids because <laughs> she can do it real quickly. And my son, Roger David Smith, real quick. I know we're out of time. We just got well, a couple more just minutes. Just a few more minutes. I want to share before we do that. There's a lot of you who are not going to celebrate the new year because you've lost loved ones. Some of you are in the hospital. Some of you are going through a hard time. But what we want to do is just let you know how much we love you and that yes. God will embrace you with his peace. He will embrace you with joy. He will embrace you so that you'll understand that even though there has been a loss, there's also a gain. And the gain is that you are still here. Yes. And that God wants to work a good work through you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end, a bright future, a new year, 2021. Wow. And so I am so grateful. We want to... Thank our family, my brothers, my sisters that are all over the United States, but specifically my son, Roger David Smith, his yes. beautiful wife, Nakiba, our grandchildren, Brianna, Alyssa, and Nia. I want to thank all of you for your support and your love for us. Uh, my my mother-in-law, who's my mama, Mia, Annie Walker, I want to thank you for how you have been praying for us and keeping us all of freedom. If I name any of you, I have to name all of you. I want to thank all of the members of Freedom Worship Center, all those who support us, all our friends, 
all of those uh, co-workers or co-laborers with us, pastors, we pray for you that God will bless you in this new year. Yes. With all that you need, all that you've asked for, all that God wants to give to you, guide you, order your steps and walk in newness of life, newness of faith, and just enjoy the new year. Regardless of the pandemic, enjoy what God has is given to you. Happy New Year. Yes, wonderful. Well, we're just about all our time, but I'm so grateful for Journey to Greatness broadcast. I'm so grateful for my studio audience. I'm also grateful for my producer, uh, Lachelle, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Leticia. Uh, Leticia Carter, I'm so grateful for her, the great job that she does in the production. And I'm just grateful for, also, I want to wish uh, a happy new year to Cornerstone Christian University students. I want, yeah, I yeah. want to wish them. They'll be graduating, yeah, they'll be graduating in, yeah, June. in June. I'm really excited yes. about it. In June, we have our graduation uh, for Cornerstone Christian University. And if you're looking to further your ed education, we have Cornerstone Christian University. And you might be a, a person that have dropped out of school. We have a acceleration high school that you yes. can actually graduate and get a diploma not a GED but a diploma and so I want to encourage you to call us at 704-322-8010 if you want to further your education and if you just want to take some classes uh, Cornerstone a Christian uh, University is here to educate you and uh, our instructors are just incredible and amazing you will have a wonderful uh, experience with them and uh, it's an awesome class, the different classes that they teach, which you can go online and check those out and see what you'll be interested in as far as Cornerstone Christian University. But don't forget, now you can get from, uh, you can get a associate's degree and, yes. and you can go all, all the way, way. <laughs> all, all to, the way, to, uh, PhD. PhD, all right. <laughs> Yes, so I want to encourage you to call us. Uh, I'm so grateful for being one of the teachers as well, along with my wife. Uh, I taught the class homiletics, and uh, uh, it was just a great pouring into the lives of the students. So thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, you who are supporting the FWC Community Development Center, uh, the Friends Who Care, don't forget to send in your pledge. Some of you are behind in your pledge. You need to catch up there. Uh, because great things are happening. But we want to say thank you for supporting us. Yes. And if you'd like to support us, go to our website. You can go to FWC, uh, 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 FWC uh, Charlotte, to our website, and the different ministries, whichever one you choose to support, will be grateful, okay? Yeah. So yeah. thank you so very thank much, you. and we're just so glad you tuned in to us, and we're so glad to come to you by way of social media, by way of television, and just share with you the goodness of God. And we want to say to you that we love you as we close. And you can also email us. You can email us at journeytogreatnessbc at gmail.com. So we got to go. We say Happy New Year to you. And as we go, we say to you, we love you, and we wish God's very best to you. But I want to minister uh, on a subject that I think is very relevant uh, to the world today, and that's mental illness. And, and the root of mental illness, and where it stems from, and where it comes from, and how we can easily, any of us, fall into mental illness. How none of us are safe from mental illness. As we know the story of the young lady who was a lawyer here in Charlotte that left here and went to New York City and was a very successful woman and doing very well in her career. A woman that had everything, a woman that had good looks and a woman that had beautiful hair, a woman that the world looked upon as having it all together. But found her place or found her space in a place 
where she was tormented and that she was depressed. And she was depressed to the degree that mental illness seeped in and captured her. And she had no hope because without hope, you can't live five seconds without hope. You can't live five minutes without hope. Once hope is gone, darkness sets in and the enemy rushes in. And when he rushes in, he comes to take you out. So therefore, we always must have the joy of the Lord Jesus in our heart. We almost always need to be excited, ignited, enthused, and infused. We always need to have the joy of the Holy Spirit. And not so much happiness. Because happiness is based on what happens. If something happens good, you're happy. And if something doesn't happen good, you're sad. So it's not about being happy. It's about having joy. And joy comes from the Holy Spirit. Joy comes from within. Happiness comes from without, the outside. But joy comes from within. And when you have the joy of the Lord, the scripture says the joy of the Lord is my strength. If you want to have strength in God, you got to stay happy and you got to stay with joy and you got to stay ex excited about life. You got to see life and for what it is and what it can become. And you have to stay as a visionary, seeing things what it should be, what it could be, what it's going to be in spite of the way it is. Even though life looks, looks like it's doom and gloom. Where you look out in the mirror or you look rather in outside and you see, oh, the clouds are, are, are it looks like it's going to rain. And it affects your emotions and you go, oh, it's going to be a gloomy day. But inside of you is sunshine. So because of the sunshine inside of you, when you look out of that glass and see all of the clouds and everything, you see beyond the clouds. You see beyond the, the darkness of, that, of those clouds. You see beyond all of what's happening in your presence. And you see the joy of God who delivered you and set you free, who died on Calvary's cross that you might have joy unspeakable full of glory Amen. we always have to walk by faith and not by sight you can't walk go through life looking at circumstances and allowing them to dictate to you your feelings because they will take you under they will take you down circumstances are there to actually empower you you to take a, a licking and keep on ticking. Every knock should be a boost. Every time you're knocked down, you get back up and you see what doesn't work and you find out what does work. Amen. You stay focused on what's, what's possible. You stay focused on what you can accomplish and what you can see happen for the glory of God. Amen. You move forward in the things of God. And though, although the enemy tries to knock you backwards, uh, my God, you say, if I'm going to fall, I'm falling forward. And you leap forward in the things of the kingdom. And you strive and you thrive forward for your kingdom building. This mental illness is serious today. Individuals are waking up and, and Satan is tormenting their mind. Satan is grabbing a hold of their thinking with us already always listening to the voices in our head that we cannot set off. The only way you can shut them down is by praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit. You can override the voices in your head that's speaking to you. You got to control your mind. Mental illness is a direct result of you not having the ability to take charge of your thinking. It takes, mental illness takes control when you submit yourself to the thinking in your head. 
When you submit yourself to the oppression and the depression that the enemy puts to all of us. All of us experience a time in life where things just seem to be jacked up, toe up from the flow up. All of us experience a time where we almost want to just give in and throw in the towel. All of us experience things that, that causes us to be affected and we respond in a certain way. All of us have a tendency to move in a direction contrary to God. But what happens is, if you're not careful, it will push you on over and you'll push you off the cliff and cause you to go up onto the the hundred and some floor and jump off the building and kill yourself if you don't guard yourself against the powers of the enemy. I'm reminded of the young man that had a mental problem. He was crazy. He was a lunatic. He stayed, the word of God says that he hung out in the graveyard. That's Mark chapter 5. When you have time, read it at your leisure. But this young man hung out in the graveyard. He hung out and made his habitat, made his dwelling in the graveyard. So he wanted to be around dead folk. He wanted to be around people who possibly could not bother him. He knew, I'm sure, that in the graveyard, they can't do nothing to me. They dead. I'm afraid of these live folk. <laughs> they can do more harm to me than the people in the grave. Yeah. So he hung out there in the graveyard for whatever reason, and he wanted to commit suicide, the scripture says, because he began to cut himself with stones. He began to cut himself, cut himself, and the people around him was concerned because of their love for mankind. So they would grab him and put chains on him and tie him up. But the demonic forces and the demons and the devils were so strong inside of this individual that he popped them chains asunder, the scripture says. He broke those chains. And said, I'm going to kill myself. I'm not going to live. I'm tired of life. I want to give up on life. I don't want to live anymore. Something has happened in his mind that he became a lunatic. He became crazy. Whatever happened, he probably had family problems. His wife probably ran off and left him. Because that's one of the reasons why people can't deal and cope with life. It's through divorce. She possibly left him and he felt so forsaken and so mental illness will creep in during a divorce. During some difficult times, you feel abandoned, you feel alone, you feel forsaken. And you open yourself up to mental illness if you're not careful. Or perhaps his wife left him because of their financial situation. Perhaps now that he lost his job, no money, wife left him. So not only does he have problems with his wife divorcing him, he broke. He busted and disgusted and can't be trusted. No money. Life is messed up. And that, that opens the door to mental illness. Financial problems opens the door to mental illness. Things happen that opens the door to illness, opens the door to sickness, opens the door to stress and problems. And when you have stress and when you have problems and when you have difficulties, that's a, the enemy has a great time, to, that's his opportunity to move in. That's his opportunity to take over. When you surrender yourself to demonic activity and allow them to make you a puppet. And too often we find individuals who are a puppet because they can't have their way. 
because they're upset with this and upset. Circumstances, life, you have to see life as exciting no matter what it is. Amen. You have to see God in working in everything. You can't have your way all the time. You cannot manipulate and control situations, allow people to be who they are, allow people to enjoy their life, allow people to celebrate them, and you celebrate with them. Don't be trying to control people and manipulate people for your own selfish gain because you're insecure, because of your troubles and because of who you are or what you went through. That's your problem. Quit putting your problem on everybody else. You got your problems. I got mine. And trust you me, I put them off on Dr. Bedell. <laughs> but I had to learn. I had to grow and develop. But she wasn't my problem. So often we see others as our problem. We see them, if they would only be like this, we would be like that. And it's not that it's God's working his divine plan to grow you up and mature you and make you who he desired you to be from the very beginning. But because you're stubborn and stiff-necked, you want to hold on to this whole attitude about how things are and how you want them to be. Things are not going to be like you want them at all times. You have to accept life for what it is. And for God's sake, grow up. And become mature, become strong, Amen. and become a woman of God, Amen. or a man of God. Amen. And not put pressure on individuals, and because you're unhappy. Because all of us know that free people, free people, but people who are bound, bind people. People who are tied up, tie up people. You know, I, I, I noticed, and I watch things a lot. We were at uh, Robin Gould's church, and uh, I was looking at a young man that was really free. And all while he was free over there, people along sitting with him was free. I look on the other side, Mr. Stiffy. He on the other side, Mr. Stiffy. Now, Mr. Stiffy is making everybody else stiff. So you will affect others. You will affect others in how you are. Free people up because you're free. Because if you're bound, you're going to bind others. And the scripture says, whom the son sets free is free indeed. And so the story is with this individual who was determined to kill himself, determined that he was miserable, and the people around him refused to be miserable. They're trying to help him, but they can't help him because he don't want their help. And what I learned, you can't help people that don't want your help. You can try all you want to. You can desire them. I remember being in Chicago. I was in Chicago during the early part of my ministry. I was taking Chicago by storm. Boy, I had an anointing on my life for drug addicts. I was shipping them out of Chicago, sending them to different places for treatment. I mean, God was using me. I was so excited. I was on uh, the television with, as a counselor uh, on the TV station with my pastor, Dr. Spencer Jones, and we were on there together, and I was a counselor, and a prostitute called. She called in, and she said that she wanted out of that lifestyle. She wanted to quit. Uh, with this pimp that had her, had her selling her body, she wanted a different life. And I said, where you at, honey? She said, I'm a, over here on State Street. I said, well, I know where 95th and State Street is because it's a whole lot of people. So I said, I tell you what, what you do is you meet me there. 
And I'm wondering, how am I, how am I going to know who she is? Well, it's a black, all black area. So the first white person I see, that's got to be her. <laughs> so I said, you meet me, you meet me there. And, and I'll get you out of that situation. You don't have to be bound by no pimp. You don't have to be selling your body and, 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 and for some man. I'm going to get you out of this. And so uh, I got my girlfriend at the time. Show you how long that was. Uh, I've been married 36 years. so you know. <laughs> I got my known girlfriend at the time. And I got the church van. And I... And, um, I had her to drive the church van, and uh, I, boy, this was exciting for me, boy. I, I, I got her to drive the church van, so I spotted her. I said, that old Caucasian, that's got to be her. Thank God it was, because I would have got kid for kidnapping, because cause she drove up in the van, and I said, get in! I snatched her in the van, take off, and boom, and we were gone. And we were out of there. So I took her to the, the church in uh, Southside Tabernacle Assembly of God Church. I took her there. And she, of course she was nervous and everything because she didn't know who we were. But we made her comfortable, bought her something to eat. And I called Chicago Teen Challenge. And I talked to the director. I didn't want to talk to no, uh, just the staff. I want to talk to the, now, I'm, you know, I'm somebody now. Before I couldn't talk to them because they was. They was uppity uppity there now. But I'm talking now to the head man. Okay. Calvin Bonzala. So I talked to him and I said, I have this young lady. Her pimp had her out there selling. She, she called in on the Christian line. And I answered the phone. And she shared with me she wanted out of that lifestyle. And I got her out of there, took her to the church, and led her in the sinner's prayer now she's born again, she knows Jesus, and she needs now to be disciple. He said, no problem, Randy, that's what they called me back then, Randy Hall. Randy Hall, send her here. I sent that sister there, and I was so excited. And then the next week, I, I called, next week I called. And uh, see, I check up on her. You know, you're supposed to check her. Like Paul, when he started a church, he went around and checked on the, the, the church. When I called, and he says, uh, Randy, I had to put her out. I was devastated. I was so hurt. Because I'm like, you could have done something. You know, I felt like he could have done something. I don't know. And he put her out. And I said, wow. And I was upset. All that hard work. Risk my life to snatch her out of the lion's den from the fiery darts of, of the wicked. And I did all of that. And now she's back on the streets. So, but I'm the type of guy I am. I couldn't let that get down. I had to keep the joy of the Lord in my strength. Amen. So I remained joyful in spite of. So my time was up there and I, it was time for me to return to Bible college. So I went back to North Dakota, Trinity Bible College in Ellendale, North Dakota. I went back there and then studied for a semester. And I came back to Chicago because the pastor said I was the greatest intern that he ever had, the greatest leader that he ever had, and he wanted me back. So I went back. I was glad because I wanted to see my girlfriend back then anyway. <laughs> but. When I got back, I went to see her. She wasn't there. She had found somebody else. <laughs> I was gone too long. <laughs> but but her, her mom said, you remember that young lady that you snatched out of, uh, from her pimp and, and snatched her up and and sent her off to Detroit Teen Challenge? I said, yeah. She said, I got a letter from her. She's at Jimmy Swagger's Bible College. Wow. 
Oh, was that a time of rejoicing. So we never know, even though a bad situation occurs, we never know the outcome. God has the outcome of these things. So I was so encouraged. So all we do is plant. One water, one plant, but God has to give the increase. Amen. And just look at Raven. Raven who left us that we thought we'd never see anymore. But God brought Raven right back, and our relationship is stronger today than it was before she left. Amen. Go ahead and give God praise. So let me wrap this story up so I can be done. So, the, so here this lunatic, this crazy man, is living in the graveyard, wanting to kill himself. They're trying to keep him from killing himself. Mental illness got a hold to him. And now he's just totally defeat. But all of a sudden, Jesus just happened to be coming by. And the scripture says that he saw Jesus. Now this guy, keep in mind, wanting to kill himself, lived in a graveyard, was butt naked, or just naked, let me say. <laughs> <laughs> Naked, naked in the graveyard, living there, made his habitat, dwelling there, and they trying to keep him from killing himself. Mental illness had, had overwhelmed him. Demons and devils had overtaken him. But the scripture says that Jesus was coming along the way, and he saw Jesus. So he saw that anointing. He saw his breakthrough. He saw his miracle. He saw an opportunity. He saw a chance for change. He saw a chance to be delivered. He saw a chance to be set free. He saw a chance for an opportunity for a new life. He saw a chance to get rid of the old. He got a chance to get rid of that mental disease. He got a chance now to be somebody. He got an opportunity now to fulfill his dreams. He got an opportunity to fulfill his aspiration. The door is opened up for him and he's ready to walk through He's ready to be delivered. Uh, he's ready to be set free. He's ready to be a, a new person. He's ready to give his life to Christ. Uh, he's ready for breakthrough. Uh, he's ready for change. Uh, he's ready for deliverance. Uh, he's ready to be set free. He's ready for a move of God. He's ready for an outpouring. Uh, he's ready for a downpouring. Uh, he's ready for the visitation of God. He's ready for God in his life. He's ready now. Yes. And in being ready. Yes. And in being ready. He was so ready for change and for a new life. And to get rid of that mental illness. He was so ready. The scripture says that he ran to Jesus. He didn't walk. He didn't tiptoe. He didn't drag his feet. The scripture says he saw Jesus afar off. You know, some people say, well, I want to get delivered, but he's too far away. I'll wait till he come back around next week. <laughs> I'll wait there. That's too far. He's here far off. I, I'll catch you next week, Jesus. No. He saw his opportunity. He saw his chance. To get out of mental illness. He saw his chance. To be set free. He saw an opportunity. And he took it. He ran to Jesus. And the scripture says. He bowed down. And worshiped Jesus. And as he worshiped Jesus. Those demons. in the mental torment. Was talking to, to, to Jesus. And saying, what have we to do with you? The devil's talking. And they got these strange. <laughs> demons and devils talk. They talking. They talking at Jesus. And so with Jesus, he didn't hold a conversation, but for a short. He said, how many of you are in here? How many inside of you? How many of you? Are, how many demons are you? How many are you in there? And the scripture says that they responded and said, we're legion. That means we're many. It's a bunch of us in here. 
He done really allowed us, all of the ones that died in the graveyard, they all in him. All the ones that was on their way, they in him. All the demons that decided it was living past years ago, all from the graveyard, all them demons were living in him. So they said, he said, we are many. <laughs> and Jesus said, in my name, cast them out. And those spirits left him. And he cast them out. And they always look for a body. Always remember that. Ever, don't ever forget that. Demons can't do nothing to you without a body. Mm -hmm. They got to have a body. So they running around looking for bodies. They're the body snatcher. They running around trying to snatch bodies. And get inside bodies. Snatch you and, 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 and get inside of you to use you like they used him. They always looking for a body. And once they leave one person, they go to another. So if you're not going to entertain them, they're going to go to your cousin. Or they're going to go to your sister. Or they're going to go to your brother. They're going to find a body. They're searching for anybody that will entertain them. That's why I'm telling you today, they cannot entertain the joy of the Holy Ghost. That's why you have to keep your joy. That's why you have to stay excited. That's the reason why you got to have the joy unspeakable, full of glory. That's why you got to keep the fire of God in your life. Because they run from you and they look for that weak person. They're bullies. They're going after ones that they can push around. One who's are weak. Ones who are timid. And they're going to enter inside of them. That's why the scripture says be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Have on the whole armor of God so you can stand against demons and devils and demonic activity. And having done all to stand, stand in your evil day. Stand anchored, rooted, and grounded in the things of the kingdom. And when the enemy tries to push you over, you stand in spite of trying to overtake you. Don't let them overtake you. You overtake them. And so the story is that when Jesus cast those demons out of, out of him, looking for a body, they couldn't find anybody close enough that was willing to accept them. Only the pigs. The pigs was the only one that welcomed them. Everybody else around there has sense enough not to open up themselves to it. And you got to have sense enough not to open yourself up to demons and devils and demonic activity. You got to have enough sense to protect yourself and to guard yourself against demons and devils and demonic activity and Satan and all of his hosts that is trying to possess you, trying to manipulate you, trying to control you. And they do it out of when you get angry, when you get mad, when you get depressed, when you're going through difficulties, when you're going through trials, when you're complaining, when you're a powder and a doubter and a do without her, when you cop attitudes, when you cop a, a way of thinking, and when you cop those that opens up the door to demonic activities to come in and take over and rule and reign in your life that's why uh, you must keep the joy of the holy spirit upon your life so that you won't have mental illness uh, that they can't torment you uh, that they can't dominate you uh, they can't control you uh, they can't manipulate you because demons come to intimidate you to manipulate you and to dominate you So you can't open yourself up to that. But when you get in the argument, confrontation with people, how many people have lost their life getting in an argument with folk and they grabbed something and knocked them in the head, they fell down. You all right? You all right? Hey, hey, you all right? Oh, Jesus, they did. You killed them out of anger, out of anger. The enemy set you up. Don't get set up by the enemy. Don't argue with anyone. 
Don't have an attitude towards anyone. Don't allow yourself to submit yourself to be ridiculed by situations and problems that causes you to have a problem. Keep your strength. Keep your joy. Keep your happiness. Don't let them affect you to the degree that it dominates and controls you and manipulates you like it did this young man. Those demons got him because he was hanging out in the wrong places. Should have been at church. Amen. He should. <laughs> he should have been in the synagogue worshiping God. Amen. He out there in the graveyard just having seances or whatever he was doing out there, calling up evil spirits. Come on. You can't play with demons. Can't play with devils. You don't for God's sake. The scripture says, give no place or no opportunity to the devil. Because if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. You open that door, he's going to kick it in. He's going to knock the door down. It's going to be a home invasion. He's going to invade your home and invade your temple and dominate over you and take over. And once they get you, they ain't letting you go. Just like the drug dealer. You ain't, going, you ain't, get, you ain't leaving the game. You've been making us money. We got you. You part of us. So if you want out, then you got to die to get out. Because you ain't getting out. That's what Satan said. You're going to die if you, if you get out with me. You're going to stay with me. And to death do us part. You married to me. Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you know that? You married to me. When you connect with them, never marry demons and devils. Never make allegiance to them. Never make make a uh, 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 never make a bond with them, because they will sabotage you. So the great thing about this story ain't closing. What was so phenomenal and awesome? This lunatic. This demonic uh, uh, man full of, that was mentally ill, that was controlled by demons and devils, that was breaking chains and ropes, they couldn't, they couldn't hold him, who wanted to could die, wanted to commit suicide, they wanted to give up on life because demons had tormented himself. He saw Jesus afar so off and he ran to Jesus and he worshiped Jesus, gave his heart to Jesus. And here's the miracle of the whole story. The next day, that all the town where this man was naked day after day, the scripture says that he was clothed and in his right mind. He had clothes on and he had his right mind because he met Jesus. What does that tell us? That we need to stay with Jesus. We need to stay connected to him. What does that tell us? We need to stay with the joy of the Lord in our heart. So that mental torment and demons. So we're not dismayed with mentally tormented by demons and devils. That they can't control us. They can't manipulate us. They can't dominate us. Because we're in Christ. And what was so amazing. Was this same man. Who was controlled by demons. And devils. This same individual. Got good sense now. He got his right mind now. He had so much good sense. He, he got signed off by Jesus. Jesus signed him off to be an evangelist and sent him out, not to one city, but sent him as an evangelist to 10 cities to go and share his story and share the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was used mightily in 10 cities 
a lunatic, a crazy man, one who lost his mind, one who was tied up, who was chained, who was in bondage, but God had need of him and set him free. And now he's an evangelist winning the world for Christ, telling folks what God had done for him. I was once a crazy man. I was once a lunatic. I was once out there in the grave. I was one time trying to kill myself. I was one time giving up on life. I was one time thinking life was over. But look at me now. 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 I'm an evangelist called by God, anointed by God, equipped by God, appointed by God, sent forth to take the message of Jesus Christ to the known world for the glory of God. Stand to your feet. I want to minister to you this morning. I'm really excited about it because I think in this season of spiritual awakening, we need to come to grips with the plan of God. We need to understand God's plan because God has a plan. So I've entitled this message, Returning to God's Original Design. Returning to God's Original Design design because God had a design for mankind and somehow it got got hoodwinked and sometimes somehow it got rail, railroaded or derailed and it didn't end up like it was supposed to be because of disobedience because disobedience will throw things off track and so as as a church it's very important that we focus on following God's word and being obedient to his word and several things happened that derailed things. And of course, all of us know about the fall of Adam and how he disobeyed God. We know that Eve was deceived. She was tricked. Uh, she was uh, deceived by, by Satan. And, but Adam willfully turned his back on God and disobeyed God. And that caused a whole ruckus there. But that was not God's design, but God had a backup plan. Glory be to God. And his backup plan was to send his son Jesus to die to redeem man, to bring us back after disobedience, to destroy the works of the devil that we could live over as overcomers. So Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. So his purpose was to destroy the works of the devil so that we can live life victorious. But somehow we have fallen away from that design that God created for us as Jesus Christ went down to hell and stripped the devil of all of his power, all of his authority, and took the keys of death and took the sting away and came up out of that grave with all power and all authority and gave it to the church and gave it to you and I that we're to live victorious, we're to live over, as overcomers, we're to live strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We have our weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. We are victorious today, positionally, but so often because that design that God created for us, we're not walking in his footsteps. Every king that was successful in life, they followed after the footsteps of their spiritual father, David. David was their spiritual father. And every king that followed after David, they were successful. They reigned long, a long time. They lived a long life. And they did well. But every king that went against the footsteps of their spiritual father, David, the design that God had for his people, all of them died in defeat, didn't reign long, killed themselves, committed suicide, and lived a life of defeat. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying we have to walk in the 
footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ as he designed us uh, victorious to walk in obedience and walk in humility and to walk humble in his sight uh, to glorify him and to magnify him and walk in victory knowing that Jesus Christ did destroy the works of the devil. Satan is defeated today. He is under our feet uh, but also too often we let him live. All too often we give him an open door. All too often we listen to his thoughts uh, just like Eva. We'll listen to the the voice of Satan, because uh, you're listening to several voices uh, with us already, always listening to the voice in our head. Uh, we're hearing these voices, uh, and it's time that we turn our station to J-E-S-U-S -S and listen to the voice of God. That's his design for mankind to hear his voice uh, and to get our marching orders from him and to get our instruction from him and get our direction from him him and walk and flow in obedience to him for the glory of God. Can you put those hands together and give God praise? One of God's original plans was that man was to be a manager. That was God's original plan that we all are managers. And we are to manage ourselves first. Because you can't manage anybody else until you first manage you. Yeah. And so often we got individuals that's trying to manage other people and they can't manage themselves. Their lives are all jacked up, tore up from the flow up. They're making uh, decisions that, that doesn't glorify God. And then they're leading people and you got a domino effect. You got the blind leading the blind and what happens? They all fall in the pit. And so God is looking for his people to go back to the true design and that is to be a manager and to manage first your life he put Adam in the garden for the purpose of managing he was to manage and till the ground he was there to manage the and, and take care of the garden and be a good manager all of us are managers and you if you cannot manage your life if you cannot manage your checkbook if you cannot manage your finances, if you cannot manage you, you'll find yourself living in defeat and you'll wonder why. But God's design for your life is that you be a good manager. That is his design for your life, that you manage well. And everyone is to manage themselves and not focus so much on everyone else. Manage yourself first. Manage you. And conquer you. Get yourself in a position where you've mastered you. Where you have overcome you. Where you're not caught up in them isms and schisms. That you're not one of those that's a nitpicker and complaining and a doubter and a powder and a do without her. You're always negative. You're always talking about folks. You're always backbiting folks. You're always tearing people down. You're always ridiculing people. You always got something negative to say. You're always tearing down folks. Uh, you're always cursing and, and, and doing all the things contrary. That is not God's plan for your life. God's plan for your life was that you manage you. And if you focus on you, you'll be busy enough. You won't have time to focus on anybody else. Yes, sir. Well, Pastor, you know, that's all good. But, you know, them folks, just, they just ain't no good over there at that church. They ain't right. You know. I can tell they be talking about me because as soon as I look at them, they, they turn their head and they act like I'm an outcast. They won't speak to me and they allow themselves to entertain that foolishness. If they master you and focus on you, you don't care what people say. You don't care what people think. All you're doing is mastering you. You're focusing on what matters to God. You focus on what's important. You focus on what is important to God to make God happy. You're not concerned necessarily caught up in your emotions about people and what they say and what they don't say. Because you can't control people. God created us all as free moral agents to, to, to move and to flow and to think. And he wanted to empower mankind to manage their lives. To manage their lives, they're, they're, they manage so well 
that others are influenced by them because he wants them to be a leader. He wants you to be a leader. He don't want you following all of the different things of the world and what the world is doing. He wants you to follow him and his design and walk in his footsteps and flow in his anointing and move forward for kingdom living. Can you clap those hands and give God praise? That's his perfect design for you to manage. He wants you to manage. You are a manager. Some of us feel like, well, I can't manage. Well, that's true. Because if you're not managing your own life, you can't manage. If you're always late to everything, if you're always not punctual, if you're always uh, not faithful in your commitment, and you make broken promises, you tell people you're going to do things and you don't do them, and you know, you know without a shout out you can't do it. Well, I'm going to loan you $100 this Friday. They call you Friday, you don't even answer the phone. Because you know you couldn't, you just wanted to shut them up. You just told them what they want to hear. And a lot of folks will just tell you what they think you want to hear. They don't want to hear that. If you're not going to loan them the money, just tell them you don't have it, you're not going to loan it to them. But don't tell them Friday you're going to loan it to them soon. As soon as I get my check, you can count on me. Just call me. I'll be there. And they call you and you're not there for them because you had no intentions. That's not managing your life. Managing your life, if you have an appointment to be somewhere, managing your life is that you're on time. Your appointment with God, you need to be on time. Your appointment with God, you need to be there early because if you come in, at, if your appointment with God is at 10 o'clock or 7 o'clock, whatever time it is, if you come in at that time, you're late. Well, I was here at 10 o'clock sharp. No, in order to be on time, you got to be early. In order to be on time, you got to be early. You can't walk in the door at a particular time and think that you are on time. Well, I made it on time. No, you get there before, before time. You know, revival takes place when a group of people and individuals have a love for God that they're going to gather together in God's design. And they're going to gather together and they're going to come together and pray. And when they come together, they come together with excitement. They come together to worship the Lord. And they don't come in dragging. They come in excited. They come in ignited. They come in enthused. They come in infused because they know they're anointed. They know they're appointed. And they come in ready to magnify and glorify God. That's when revival takes place. That's where spiritual awakening takes place. That's when the move of God takes place. When people have a hunger for God, for His his desire and his plan for their life. Spiritual awakening is very, very, very powerful if we operate in spiritual awakening and operate in the design. And so this morning we want to turn and refocus our emotions and rethink this thing of how we're going to live life powerfully and how we're going to manage ourselves. And we're going to take our eyes off of everybody else. We're going to take our eyes off of nitpicking on Sister Suki and Brother Bobo and Sister Strawberry. We're going to take our eyes off of them and we're going to put our eyes on the plan of God and his design and his purpose and his plan. The children of Israel, they got in trouble because they wanted a leader. And God's plan and design is that everyone is a leader. That you are a leader. God never wanted a king for, for his people. That was not his plan. That was not his design. They wanted a king. They wanted to be like everybody else. And so on that we want to keep up with the Joneses. We want to be like everybody else. They get a new car. Uh-oh, time for me to get a new car. Because the Joneses got one. Or we want to, the new fashions, we want to keep up with what everybody else is doing. 
Your job as an individual is to be a designer. Design your own clothes. Let everybody follow you. <laughs> People get rich because of individuals following them, but they're leaders. They step up in faith and they're designed what God has given to them. They don't follow the fashions of man. They follow the fashions of God. And they're playing what God has for them. And the witty inventions and the revelations that come to their spirit. And if you're walking with God, he's going to talk to you. If you're walking with God, he's going to speak to you. If you're walking with God, you're going to know God. If you're walking with God, you're going to hear God when you're walking with God. And he's going to give you witty inventions. He's going to give you ideas. You ever wonder why Pastor Walker was able to, to create in the midst of Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte, we springboarded many of ministries, as you know. Now the Hispanic ministry. Walking with God. And it didn't happen overnight. That was a desire I had years ago. As a matter of fact, when I started Cornerstone Christian University, I had a vice president. I won't name their name because you'll know him. And I had a vice president, and that was one of my goals. And I shared, I said, we are going to have a Hispanic side of our university. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Shot it down. And of course that crushed my spirit. Because I was excited. I was thrilled. I saw the vision. And now it is it's three and a half years later. Oh, yeah, three and a half years later. It's coming to fruition. So sometime the vision will tarry. So sometime, but it says write the vision and make it plain. So that he that hear the, 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 the he that hear the vision or will read the vision, will understand the vision. And I wrote the vision down and made it plain and got with a group of Hispanics and they saw it and their eyes began to pop. They got so excited, they just began to talk. I had to keep bringing order to the meeting because they were so excited. Let's do this, we can do this, we can do that. We gonna do this, we gonna do that. They were excited about it. And so now it has come to fruition. And grand opening is March 5th. But that's when you're following the design of God. His original plan for your life. But so often we get derailed because of our stinking thinking. Because of us thinking things and focusing on what doesn't matter to God. Because with us already always listening to the voice in our, in our head. And we have four voices that we listen to. Your voice, God's voice, Satan's voice, and right now, my voice. <laughs> and so we listen to the voices in our head. And we have to, as believers, hear the voice and the design of God's plan for your life. Amen. So God's plan was never for them to have a king. He wanted all of them to get their instructions from him. And that's his plan today. He wants each one of us to get our instructions from him. But we're getting tainted and twisted, and we're hearing all kind of voices, and our emotions get involved. Oh, child, shoot. Oh, child, you know, I don't care. I ain't going to do it that way. I don't care what you say. I'm not... <laughs> It's either my way or the highway, baby. <laughs> and, we, and we take on these attitudes and disposition instead of humbling ourselves and hearing your instructions from God in the plan. God has a plan, and then we hear the instructions from God in that plan. And when the pastor or leader or overseer unleashes the vision, that's where you see where you fit in the puzzle. Well, I can't usher. I can't sing. Production team don't look like they can teach us too much. They are always having problems. Well, I, I don't know what I can do. I don't know. I, I, I don't like smiling and greeting folk. 
They can smile and grin at me, and that'll be okay, but I don't feel like meeting everybody. Hi, welcome to Freedom Worship Center, Charlotte. And don't let me say, I pull out the, the gun. I gotta take your temperature. Oh, poke, jump. It's, that's not a gun, that's just, just to take your temperature, dear. <laughs> you know, people got backgrounds just messed up. Yeah, they got backgrounds. You pull out something like this here, you know, I, I, and I say that, y'all, because this is honest God's truth. Y'all, <laughs> confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. Do you all know why I never have one of those uh, goosenecks on my, on my uh, podium? Well, I have it there because I don't want nothing staring at me because it, it reminds me of looking down the barrel of a gun. I've been there a couple times. And see, I mastered that today. I probably could put a gooseneck up here today. But back in my early ministry, the, the, the elders and deacons, they didn't know why. They said, Pastor, why you, know, you know, just put something up there to hold the mic. I said, no, I, I didn't explain to them why. You know. <laughs> I just said, I, I, love, I prefer to hold, hold the mic. But it was, it, it, I was terrified. I stand there and that's looking at my fa in my face. It reminds me of them 357 Magnums. See, so, so most of you don't know, know that I was shot in the head and left for dead. And if you don't believe it, you can feel the lead. <laughs> Amen. So, so, so the, the scars of that design finally wore off of me. See, your past design has to wear off of you as you grow and develop in the things of the kingdom of God. You can't stay in reverse. You can't stay in neutral. You can't be going to, through life looking through the rear view mirror at yesterday. You can't live life like that. God's design is new every day for your life. And when you wake up in the morning, you got to get your marching orders from God. You got to hear what God's design and God's plan is for your life. Because he said, I know the thoughts I have towards you. I know my thoughts. But do you know my thoughts towards you? I know my thoughts to, towards you. And my thoughts is to give you an expected end. In other words, a bright future. God promised everyone a bright future that follows his design. So we have to return to the original design of God. We have to return to the original plan of God for our life. And once we get that plan and our marching orders, we are headed to great and mighty things. We're headed to, to do great and mighty exploits for the kingdom of God. And all the enemy who is defeated already, when you recognize that he is trying to rise up against you, you declare to him, the blood of Jesus is against you. I'm an overcomer. I came over. I'm victorious. I'm a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And I tell you what, Satan, if you don't get out of my face, I'm going to go upside your head with an anointing and cause you to run. And you're going to run so fast. And as I continue to praise God. I'm going to drive you away praising God. I'm going to run you away as I magnify and glorify God. And you, how, you know how Satan is. He's stubborn. Uh, He's going to try to stay around. So the more he stay around and the more you just praise God, the more you just magnify God because you know he's already defeated. Uh, and then all of a sudden he'll get tired. He'll say, you're giving me a headache. Uh, you're driving me crazy. You're getting on my nerves. Uh, I I can't take it anymore. I got to leave you. And you drive that demon that's trying to hinder your design. You drive him away. But so often we entertain him. So often we welcome him. Because we try to get in cahoots with, with what he's doing. We try to come up with things that the devil has good ideas. You know, you can make some big money. Uh, all you got to do is... Uh, connect with the drug dealer and uh, you can do well yeah yeah you could do well you know you, you, your cousin was a dope dealer did you see all that gold on his neck did you see that Benz he was riding yeah did you, you see all that money he came over at the family reunion flashing uh -huh. you know you're a dope dealer 
you know, hey, he can hook you up. <laughs> and he can hook you up all right. Because that's not God's plan for your life. Your plan and God's plan for your life is for you to get your marching orders from him. And to hear his design for your life. And to follow his design and walk in his footsteps and glorify him. So I'm here to encourage you this morning as we have our spiritual awakening. That we go back to the design. Let's return to the original design of God. And that is that all of us are leaders. And leadership is only simply simple. No more, no less. Leadership is this. No more, no less. Here's what leadership is. It's influence. And you influence people all the time and don't even know it. Either negative or positive, you influence them. So you are a leader. But you got to get present to the fact that you are a leader. And you got to get present to the design and return to the original design of God. And that is that you manage your life well. Yeah. And once you manage your life well, you have the ability to help and influence others to manage their life well. And you're walking in the footsteps of God. Because God never created you to be a person that walks substandard or less than never created you that way he created you to lead he created you to lead and to follow him so in closing I want to say to you return to God's original plan Quit listening to the voices in your head. Quit listening to people. Listen to headquarters, which is in heaven. Listen to the voice of heaven that will give you your marching orders every single day. Will give you the design and his plan for your life so that you can succeed. God wants you to succeed. He wants you to live life the abundant. He said, I would above all that you prosper and be in good health as your soul prosper. God has your best interest at heart. In closing, the children of Israel, they died in defeat. That first generation never, ever, ever, ever entered into the promised land. God had a place for them, a design for them to, to bridge them from slavery to bondage, from Pharaoh to take them to a process of the wilderness for a learning experience. <laughs> for a learning experience not to get stuck there but they got stuck in the wilderness because they kept going around and around only to go 11 miles to the promised land they kept going in circles because they changed they changed the design and when we change the design we're just going to go around in circles in life. But if we follow the plan of God and we return to the original plan, God can get us to that place, the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. Paradise can get us to a place of prosperity. And we don't have to be like that generation that died in defeat because of their backbiting gonna kill the pastor. What was wrong with them? What was wrong with them thinking that they could take Pastor Moses out? 
What's wrong with them? What was wrong with them to say, I'm gonna, I don't like this plan, God's, God's plan, and I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back into bondage. I'm gonna go back under the hard taskmaster of Pharaoh. What was wrong with them? They were twisted in their head. And I'm here to tell you today, some of us are twisted in our head. And some of us are hearing the voices of the enemy that's keeping us going in circles. So my prayer to you today and my message to you today is let's stop going in circles. We don't need that song that you got me going in circles. Oh, round and around I go. I'm strung out over you. We don't need that. We don't need you going around in circles. We need you to go back to the original design of God. And that is that you manage your life well and that you become a leader and you get your marching orders and have the influence to influence others to go with you, not you going with them. So thanks this morning, I want to encourage you, find the perfect plan in God's design for your life. And don't seek it out with anybody else. Well, Pastor, what do you think I'm supposed to do? What do you think, Pastor? I think you need to seek God and get the directions from Him. That's what I think you should do. But if nothing else, just follow Jesus. Walk in his footsteps, because you can't go wrong. Stand to me. I want to minister to you this morning, risk the pain for the better good. Risk the pain for the better good. A risk is something that may end up in failure. A risk is something that you take that may or may not turn out to the best interests of yourself. A risk is something that, that, that we take a chance. <laughs> that that uh, we, we are optimistic that it, it's going to turn out for our good, but, but it may not. 
It may not work uh, for our good. At the time, we may not quite see it prosper us like we intended. But this morning, I want to minister to you, risk the pain, risk the pain for the greater good. Hebrews chapter 11 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen or not yet revealed to the physical senses. For by it the elders, an elder is one who gained experience through his ministry, not an older person necessarily. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Father I thank you for your word. And I ask in the name of your son Jesus and his anointing. To come upon me to minister grace unto the hearers. That their lives will be impacted and that they would develop to take a risk. To take a chance. When things don't look really that great but they're willing to take a chance. When people have hurt them. When people have did them wrong. When people have mishandled them. That they'll take a risk to forgive them. And to wipe their slate clean and give them another chance. The risk that we all have to take in life at times. So today, as I minister to take a risk for the better good, I pray, Lord God, as I tread upon new ground and new territory, that, Lord God, you would anoint me afresh and anew, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Saints, this morning, I want to minister a word that I believe will challenge your heart, will inspire your heart, and will move your heart. I believe this morning that as I minister the word of God, that it will help impact your life for the better good. That you can experience the experience of the experience of living life victorious not allowing things to interfere with your life that hinder you and hoodwink you and bamboozle you and cause your life to be jacked up, tore from the floor. So this, this morning, we're going to take a chance. Now, when we talk about a risk, as we talk about the possibility it can go sour, it may not turn out to the best that we want, wanted to turn out. We may feel like that I did took this risk, I took this chance, and it backfired on me. <laughs> but this morning as I minister your God's word, I want us to get present to how powerful it is to take a risk. A mom who who is pregnant she takes a risk she don't know if that baby's going to be born uh, retarded mentally ill handicapped or whatever the case she takes a risk so in life we must take risks in life we must take chances we can't just go through life and not be willing to take a risk and so often we are afraid to take a risk. The word of God declares that without faith it is impossible to please God. That they that come into God must believe that he is. And that God is a rewarder to them to take a risk. <laughs> God is a rewarder to them that leap out in faith. God is a rewarder to those that take a chance. God rewards those that, that believe that 
The outcome is going to justify the means. God honors those people. Faith honors God and God honors your faith. So this morning, as we look at how uh, a parent take risk and how you take risk when people hurt you, when people mishandle you, when people treat you a certain way and you're devastated, you're hurt by that. There is a risk involved in you loving them. It's a risk involved because you have been damaged. You've been hurt. You've been mishandled and you've been mistreated. So therefore now you avoid them. You have nothing to do with them. You don't want no interaction with them. You're not going to take a risk because it's too painful. It's the pain of life that we're afraid of, of that pain that, that penetrated us and devastated us and hurt us. Perhaps it's a loved one that you were, gave your life to and they cheated on you. And they, they slept with another woman or slept with another man or whatever the case may be. Infidelity was so evident, it devastated you. And it caused pain. And it caused hurt. Well, I got news for you. Life is painful. Life hurts. But in life, when the pain comes... We have to take a risk and reach out in love in spite of. We have to overcome the hurt. We have to overcome the pain. We have to overcome the, our difficulties. And we're going to look in the word of God where several individuals took a risk. And they were able to stand in the midst of pain and suffering for the better good. And so this morning, my, my goal is to get you present to your feelings or what you're feeling inside and the hurt and the pains of life and the past experiences that you've had, that you've hid and you put them, you, you swept them under the rug and you, you don't deal with them. You don't talk about them. You don't share with anybody. This is your private secret of, of all that you've hidden in the hurt and the pain and the disappointment that you've had in life. But I got news for you. You can't move forward with unresolved issues in the past. You have to resolve those issues. That pain has to be healed. That pain has to be dealt with. That, that, that pain has to be confronted. Because if you don't confront it, you'll go through life miserable and the other person is doing quite well. The other person is having a good old time, enjoying life, and you're going through the pain of suffering because you held on to the pain. And so this morning, as I, as I challenge your hearts to take a risk for the better good, as I challenge your heart to x-ray your heart and see if there's anything in your heart that is separating you from living life powerfully, Living life intentional, living life strong and mighty and courageous. That you are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And the blessings of God overtake you because you positioned yourself in spite of the odds. You have took it on yourself to endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. You have took it on yourself to endure and to stand still and know that God is working his supernatural divine power and intervention in your life. And you get a hold to the fact that this is going to make me stronger. Because problems are part of God's plan to make you. I'll say that again. Problems are part of God's plan to make you. It's to see what you're made of, to see how strong or, or to see how you're going to trust him. 
As we know the story of Job, we know that Job lost everything. We know that Job was devastated, but yet in the midst of his devastation, he never cursed God. He praised God. Even when his nagging wife said, why don't you curse God and die? He was strong enough and trusted God enough to endure the pain and to take a risk and keep going. Job took a licking, but he kept on ticking. It's an example for us that when we have difficult times in life, when life throws us a, a lemon and life throws us all of the, the horrible things in life and it overwhelms us and it take, gets the best of us, Job taught us a tremendous lesson. Blessed I, is the name of the Lord. Blessed I came into the world and naked I'll leave here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all things give thanks for this is the will of God concerning us. That we're to give him praise and glory even in the midst of our storm. Even in the midst of our trial. Even in the midst of our difficulty. We got to take a risk. Even Jesus took a risk. Even Paul took a risk. Even Moses took a risk. All these gentlemen took risk for the better good. Get your Bible, turn them with me. Well, I'm sure you have it now. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's look at verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had come to years, in other words, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Listen to this. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He chose the difficult route. He didn't choose easy rather than effort. Because if you choose easy rather than effort, you're going to choose slow decay. And it will ultimately cause you to live in defeat. But Moses, being who he was, took a risk for the better good. He said, I am not going to choose easy. I'm going to suffer the afflictions with my people. I'm going to go through the pains of life. I'm going to go through the difficult. I'm not going to bail out because I got an easy way to get out of this situation and leave all of them hanging. No, he chose to suffer with his people for the better good. And so we have to sometimes choose to suffer and go through the painful side of life. And accept the pain within for the better good. To minister strength unto those who are weak. And those who have preyed upon individuals. And those who have back, uh, was able to, was started backbiting folks. And tearing people down. And ridiculing them. And, and trying to destroy them. We have to stand up. Even though it's painful in life. When we hear those things. We got to stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We got to stand strong as an over. Overcomer. We got to stand strong and mighty and handle and take that risk of that pain that hurts within for the better good. We got to endure hardness. We got to stand strong in the liberty where Christ has made us free. We got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might having on the whole armor of God that we can stand against every demon and every devil. That we can show demonic activity uh, that you're not going to win. I'm going to take a risk for this person because I love mankind. I'm going to take a risk for this person. I'm going to love them in spite of. I'm going to take a risk of with this person in spite of the way they treated me. I'm going to take a risk uh, and love them in spite of the way they dogged me out. Uh. I'm going to take a risk in spite of the fact that they left me hanging. I'm going to take a risk uh, no matter how they have mishandled me. I'm going to take a risk because they have did me wrong. I'm still going to take a risk and 
and love the hell out of them. Uh, I'm going to love them in spite of uh, I'm going to care for them in spite of uh, I'm going to love the hell out of them. I'm going to outdo them in love because uh, I'm going to take a risk. Uh, it may cost me something. Uh, it may be painful. Uh, it may hurt. Uh, but I'm going to take a risk for the better good. Can you clap those hands and give God praise? You can be seated. Pastor Moses didn't choose the easy side of life. And we can choose the easy side of life because it's easy. It takes its least resistance. But it takes a risk when you go against the odds. When you, when you go against what is in spite of the pain and the hurt, that you risk that pain. Just like the, the mom who risked that pain in giving birth to a child. She risked that pain. It's said that they can die on the delivery table. It says that they can go into a coma on the deliverance table. It said that they can have multiple complications on the deliverance on the delivering table, but they take a risk for the better good. They take a risk, a chance for the better good. Let's take a risk and a chance for the better good to bring about glory to God, to see God glorified in the midst of the storm and in the midst of the way things have happened. Let's not let Satan win over us at any given moment, don't give him the satisfaction of getting you discouraged or getting you down. Don't let him have that opportunity to have you being a powder and a doubter and a do without her. Don't let him have you where you so in defeat that you totally got your face to the ground crying in defeat. Pull me up. Don't let it get you to the point where you want to commit suicide. That you don't want to live. That you just want to run and run and run and run and have no, no, no way to go. Have no, don't even know where you're going. You just want to run. Just want to get away. As David said, if I had wings like an eagle, I'd fly up out of here. Because he had family problems. He had difficulties. And when we have problems, we want to get out of our problem rather than face the risk of the pain. The pain is so severe, it hurts. It hurts and it's painful, true enough. But we have to face and take a risk with that pain in order to grow in the things of God. Because it will stifle your growth. And then you'll wonder why you're a spiritual midget. <laughs> You'll wonder why that you're not being prosperous and blessed and doors are not open for you. And you're not finding the favor of God. And you're not finding God overwhelming you with, with blessings and prosperity. You wonder why. Unknowingly, it works against you and you don't even know it. That's why we have to take risk. We have to take a chance. We have to risk that pain, that horrible pain of the hurt and the devastation that we've had. Go with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We see where Paul took a risk. Because so often we can have a relationship go sour. It could be a relationship, a husband and wife, or a engagement that breaks up, or an anticipation of a relationship and a future with someone. And you know how it is when you're in that moment of visual, visual, when you're visualizing how it's going to be. 
And you've already seen yourself happy. You've already seen yourself just overwhelmed with joy. And right before your very eyes, it crumbles. Because they run off with another woman or they run off with another man. Or they call you and tell you the engagement is off. Or the marriage is off. So now you're not going to love anymore. I ain't trusting no woman and never again in my life. I ain't trusting no man ever again in my life. Because of that, that hurt. Because of the pain. You got to take a risk to love again. You got to take a risk to love again. Or perhaps a church, you were devastated in a church. And that church, things went sour. So you say, I'm never going to set foot in another church again in my entire life. And we take this attitude and we come against that I'm not having nothing to do with church folk. And all they are is a bunch of hypocrites. All they are is a bunch of phonies. Because of the pain in your life. But you got to risk that pain for gain. And rearrange some things. <laughs> Jimmy Carter. <laughs> You, you got to take these risks in life. You can't just settle for and stay at home having a pity party, hurt and devastated. You got to clean up the mess. Because you ain't squeaky clean in the whole situation, by the way. Because we always think we are, we are the victim. We always think it's, it's everybody else's fault. Do we ever look in the mirror? Do we ever take a look and see what role we played in things going sour? Do we ever take a look at that? Has that ever been important to you to see, well, what did I, how, you know, maybe I could have handled it better. That's when maturity and growth develops, when you turn the spotlight on you. When you turn the mirror around and you look at you and you see yourself for who you are and what you can do better for kingdom building, what you can do better to glorify God, what you can do better to be an example of, for the body of Christ. We need examples today in the body of Christ. We need people who have been devastated and hurt and went through trials and say, I love them in spite of. And I'm going to wipe this slate clean. And I'm going to give them another chance. And I'm going to start all over again. It's going to be rough. So rough. But we're going to make it. <laughs> Starting all over again. To start all over. Hit the restart button. Start all over with that person. And say we're going to start all over again. We're going to put in bury the hatchet. We're going we're gonna to quit the, the tit for tat. We're going to quit arguing with one another, pointing the finger who was wrong, trying to make the other one wrong. And we're going to bear that and say, I'm going to deal with my pain and you deal with yours. You deal with your hurt because I'm, really, I'm ready to take a risk. Now, in taking a risk, as I alluded to earlier, that there's a chance that it can go sour. It's a chance that it can fail. It's a chance that it may not work out to your best interest. But you've got to be willing, as believers, to take a chance. You've got to be willing, as believers, to wipe the slate clean, as Christ taught us. The God of a second chance. We've got to have that same mentality as Christ taught us. To forgive. To let it go, to send it forth, and let it drop. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. Verse 7 says, 
Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. Man, he was getting, and all of us know Paul was, the apostle was getting powerful revelation. They could have puffed him up. Could have got him proudful, arrogant, cocky, conceited. There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I be exalted above measure. For this thing I sought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. But he said unto me. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly therefore would I rather glory in my infirmity. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. <laughs> Glory to God. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Glory to God. In my weakness, uh, when I deal with the pain, uh, when I get present to the pain of life, uh, in my weakness of that pain, uh, I become stronger. Uh, I become courageous. I become uh, mighty. I become awesome for kingdom building. In my weakness, uh, I become strong, the word of God said. It's going to strengthen me in my very weakness, uh, in the difficulties of trials in life, uh, when all hell is breaking loose, uh, when my life is messed up, uh, and I'm weak, uh, and I'm Fear, fear, fear I, and I'm, I'm feeble minded when all of that's taking place uh, in the midst of that because of the grace of God, because of the anointed one and his anointing, uh, because of who he is. In my weakness, I'm strong and mighty and courageous and more than a conqueror. Can you clap those hands and give God praise? <laughs> <laughs> in my weakness I'm made strong he says in my weakness I'm made strong so he says in this suffering that I'm going through this pain I'd rather suffer and endure the pain for the better good. Because out of that pain and suffering. God is getting glorified. Yeah. And the key here. Is so that God. Is glorified. The key in your pain and suffering. As he says if you suffer with me. He says Christ says. If you suffer with me. You will reign with me. In other words, you will rise up strong and courageous and bold and be mighty every single time in the midst of your suffering. Suffering only endure for a night, but joy come in the morning. Suffering will come. Tough times will come. But tough Christians will stand strong and endure hardness as a good soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead and clap those hands and give God praise. So Paul was willing to suffer and endure. He didn't say, well, if this pain don't leave me by tomorrow, I ain't serving you, God. If you don't do something about this pain, you ain't real. If you don't do something about this, God, you don't love me. If you don't do this about, about this pain, God, you don't get it about me. Because if you really love me, you take this pain away. You take this hurt. You heal my heart if you really love me. You heal my broken heart <laughs> if you really, 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 really love me. He didn't say that at all. God said, I'm not taking it away from you. It's going to keep you humble. That's what he sold him, paraphrasing. It's going to keep you humble. I got to give you more revelation, but I got to keep you humble. Because next thing you know, you think you God. 
<laughs> I'm surmising here. But, but we can easily get caught up and get, get arrogant and, and cocky and think we all of that. And then some, when God puts his hand on us and we keep seeing miracles happen and the next thing. But that's a sign to keep us humble. And that's what it was for his life. The suffering of the thorn in his flesh was to keep him in humility. And sometimes God has to allow things in our life to keep us humble. To keep us dependent upon him. Because if, if we didn't depend on him, we'd start thinking it's us that gets power to get, get wealth. Instead of God that gives power to get wealth. We'll think it's us. Look what I did. I did this all by myself. My husband didn't help me. My wife didn't help me. Nobody helped me. I raised this $10,000 for the walkathon all by myself. The sister Letitia didn't do nothing. Verdell didn't do nothing. I did it all by myself. Dangerous. Dangerous. To get caught up and deprived. And that's what happens if we don't take a risk to the pain for the better good. Got to take a risk with the pain. You can't sweep it under the rug thinking the pain will disappear. Abracadabra, hocus pocus, pain disappear right now. No. The pain is an indication that something's wrong in your spiritual life. The pain is, is of something's wrong. It's like a car that has a check engine light. It lets you know. And I'm about to say this one again. The check engine light comes on to let you know that something's wrong with the vehicle. <laughs> Okay, pain comes in your life to let you know something's wrong. Now, you can take it to a jack leg mechanic with your light on. <laughs> and he can destroy your vehicle. He can mess it up, not knowing what he's doing. Or you can take it to the dealer that knows everything about it because they're they're part of the manufacturer. So when you're hurting and, and in pain, you can take that pain to Sister Sookie and Brother Bobo or Sister Strawberry, whoever you want to take that to. But let me suggest to you to take that pain to Jesus. Go ahead and clap those hands and give God praise. Because he's the one that can fix, he's the manufacturer. He can fix the pain. Because there's an indication something's wrong. You don't go through life hurting and pain and miserable. That's not what God has for our life. He said, I would above all that you prosper and be in good health as your soul prosper. So your soul has to prosper. Your mind, your will, and your emotions has to develop. And the only way they're going to develop, when pain comes, you go to the manufacturer and say, I'm in pain. And you get present to why you're in pain. And then you ask him to fix it, because you can't. Because if you could have, it, you would have never let it happen in the first place. But it happened, and the pain is there. So now go to the person who can fix it. So often we want to go to the person who destroyed it. The person that created the pain. Well, you put it there, now you take it away. Tell me you forgive me. <laughs> forgive me now. You better tell me right now. Oh my God. If you don't forgive me, I'll hate you the rest of my life. No. No. Let the manufacturer, almighty God, Fix it for you. But be willing to take 
that risk for the better good. I'm getting ready to wrap it up shortly. Go with me if you would to Matthew's gospel. As we see Moses who suffered affliction and Paul suffered affliction for the better good. Now let's look at Jesus who suffered affliction for the better good. Matthew's gospel chapter 17 when you have his amen. It's in the New Testament. <laughs> Glory to God. Let's look at verse. Matthew's Gospel. Let's look at verse, I may just have to quote it to you. I'll just go ahead and quote it for you. Jesus on the cross. These was the words that he said. He said, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? In all of the agony and pain and difficulty that he went through, as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and those Roman soldiers arrested him and, and took him to the place of the skull, to Calvary, to crucify him. And as those Roman soldiers beat him and, 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 and ripped his flesh off of his bones and how all the agony and the pain and the suffering that he went through. He took a risk with that pain for the better good. The scripture says he endured the cross. He endured the persecution for the better good. He endured all of the pain of, of the agony of being ridiculed and being, uh, being nailed and those spikes into his hands and into his feet and the spear shoved up into his side and out came water and blood for our sins. He took that risk of the pain of being crucified for the better good. And if he went through all of that for the better good, how much more can we go through? Or how much can we tolerate a little pain and a little disappointment and a little hurt for the better good? If he could go through all of that and say, forgive them for they know not what they do. If he can forgive them after the way they mishandled him and crucified him and beat him and, and, and treated him executional style murder and he can forgive them. How much more can we forgive a person who said something that they shouldn't have said about us? How much more can we forgive a person who has stepped on our toe or a person who has has done some things that we didn't appreciate, that we were upset about, that, that made us angry and made us mad and upset us and hurt us because they said some things about us. If we can't forgive them when Christ forgave you, and Christ forgave you for, for your sin, and you know forgiveness, you know what it is, because you've had it inside of you. You have been forgiven. You've been applied to your life. You know what it is to be forgiven, so it's time now that you forgive. For the better good. You can't hold on to those things that keep you down. You can't hold on to no. Jesus refused to hold on to it. He let it go and said, forgive them. He could have brought down legions of angels from heaven and said, zap them like crispy critters. I ain't going through this for them. They need to be tortured. 
They need to be brutally mishandled like they handled me. An eye for an eye, a two for a two. <laughs> no, that was not his response. Forgive them. And at the darkest point in his life, when he's going through this most difficult time in his life, he said, forgive them. Because he took a risk for the better good. He took the risk of that pain for the betterment for you and I. Because he took that risk, we are saved today. Because of that risk that he took, our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because of that risk that he took, we will have eternal life. And eternal life doesn't start when you die. You got eternal life right now. You're going to live forever and ever and ever. Your spirit shall rule and reign and you will live victorious just like you are now. You will live like that for the rest of your entire life and to this world, the world to come. Because of him taking that risk of pain for gain. He took that risk a pain for your gain. Go ahead and clap those hands and give God praise. During the difficult times in his life, he thought about you. And if you were the only person in Jesus' day that were alive, he would have died for just you. You are that important to God. We see, oh, he died for the world. He died for the masses, but he would have died just for you, just for little old you, because he loved you that much that he risked the pain for the better good. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying today, you're going to have to take a risk. It hurts. You're going to have to take a chance. You're going to have to forgive them in spite of the fact that you think they're going to do it again. You think they're going to do it again. And over and over and over. So you refuse to give them another chance. Or you refuse to take a risk for that pain. But Jesus did it. Well, that's Jesus. I ain't none of Jesus. Well, you want to be like Jesus. You want to act like Jesus. And you want to respond like Jesus would. Take a risk for that pain that's inside of you today. Take a risk and let God heal that pain. Because something is wrong. And the only way it's going to be fixed is you take it to the place who can fix it. And that's God Almighty. You don't want to take your heart to a jack leg, some witchcraft, demonic activity, reading palm rascal. You don't want to do that. You want to take it to the Lord in prayer and leave it there. So as I close, I went through a lot of difficulties in life, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of agony. But when I realized what Christ did for me, I would not stoop to lower myself to think that I'm better than Christ. And it's arrogant and cocky to think that you're better than Christ. And that's what you're saying when you say, I'm not going to forgive them. You say, I'm better than Christ. He was Jesus. He could do that. But I can't. And I ain't.
telling you today, take a risk, take a chance for the better good. your Bibles this morning I am going to minister to you the battle of the mind because as I was sharing and alluded to earlier that our success is based upon a consistency and a vision to create what's possible and our adversary the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he can destroy seeing who, whom he can hoodwink, bamboozle, and trick and deceive. And with us already always listening to the voice in our head, the battle is in the mind. A mind's a terrible thing to waste. So this morning, as I minister to you the battle of the mind, I want you to get present to the fact that Satan is always talking and he's always sharing things and ideas to get you off track to derail you from moving into your greatness and becoming extraordinary Satan always perpetrates against you and he attacks your mind he attacks you by suggestive thoughts now let's get something straight this morning from the onset Satan has no power. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he went down to hell, stripped the devil of his power, came up out of that grave. He said, all power. Say all power. All power. All power. All power, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. That says that Satan has no power. Well, you say, well, how does he accomplish so much in life? He accomplishes so much in life because he has the ability to influence. His ability to influence. And so often we become a puppet. I'm your puppet. So often we become Satan's puppet. Where he has us on a string. And he begins to maneuver and manipulate us. And unfortunately a lot of times we fall prey to his thinking. That's why we have to have on the whole armor of God and we have to have the helmet of salvation, which is the mind of God. The helmet of salvation is the mind of God. You got to have God's mind. You got to think like God, act like God, talk like God and understand who God is and what he does. And so often our adversary with us already always listening to the voice in our head, speaking to us, causing us to make the wrong choices, the wrong decisions. And trust me, take it from someone that knows one bad decision, wrong decision, bad decision, horrible decision can cause you a lifetime of misery. Are y'all in here? It can cause you a lifetime of misery. So you have to be careful of your decisions. You have to be careful of your choices. Because your choices that you make with us battling in the mind. Our adversary wants us to make the wrong choice. So many young people have made the wrong choice. Out of anger. They got upset and had a fight. And they lost the fight. And pride got in the way, so they went home and got daddy's gun. And they came and shot the young man, and they felt justified. What you don't realize is that when you're having a fight and somebody hits you, or somebody smack you, even if you got a license to carry a gun, you don't have a right to shoot them. No matter what that person does to you, in, unless they have a gun, or your life is threatened, you don't have a right to shoot them. In other words, if somebody smack you and they hit you, all it is is a fist fight. 
So you might as well tell your wife, hold this gun. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you don't have a right. But with us already always listening to the voice in our head, how dare he hit me? How dare? And we listen to the voice of Satan. And we make a bad choice. And next thing we know, we find ourselves in prison. We find ourselves behind bars because of one bad choice. That's why you have to make the choices that are led by the Spirit of God. So get your Bibles and turn them with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. And we're going to minister to you this morning the battle of the mind. Because it's vitally important that we understand that our adversary attacks our mind. That's the battleground. Second Corinthians chapter 10, when you have it, say amen. amen. Glory be to God. Let's look at verse 3. The scripture says, for though we walk in the flesh, that means in the natural for though we walk in in the natural or the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not natural, they're not world, worldly. They're not just weapons that, uh, well they are weapons of mass destruction. Destruction. <laughs> But they're, they're, they're are not carnal. They're not natural. You got to know that you're not fighting a demon and a devil that you can see. You're fighting an invisible demon that you cannot see. But you have to be smart enough to find ways to be able to see him. Reminds me of the, of the invisible man. I remember as a kid watching the story of the Invisible Man. The Invisible Man, he terrorized New York City. I mean, he went in the banks and robbed banks. Money was disappearing because they couldn't see him. They couldn't see him, so he did all kind of things, the Invisible Man, because they couldn't see him. And they couldn't catch him because they couldn't see him. But young, one young man got smart enough to set up a trap for him. And he set this trap up for the invisible man and put a paint bucket over on top of the door. And so when he came into that bank, that particular bank, he opened the door and the paint bucket fell on him. And they were able to see him. And they captured the invisible man. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying you got to set yourself up against the devil so that you can get some spiritual binoculars, that you can get some glasses, them 3D glasses or whatever it takes so that you can see your adversary, that you can see your, that demon, that devil and that demonic activity that's coming your way. You got to have ability to see him even though he's invisible. You got to find ways to see him, to spot him, to capture him. Amen. Because if you don't capture him, he'll capture you. You got to capture the enemy. And so the scripture says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having a readiness to avenge all disobedience when disobedience is fulfilled. The moment fulfilled. So when, it's, when disobedience comes into your life, you have to have the ability to capture disobedience and put it in its place. Because that's what gives Satan a license to attack you. It is in the disobedience of where you're out of the will of God because of decisions you make that put yourselves in arm's way of Satan. So we have to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And the scripture makes it so plain for us. It says this, 
that we are to have the mind of Christ. The scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant and came in the likeness of us. And being found in fashion as us, he humbled himself and came obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Amen. So you got to exalt yourself with the presence and the power of God to meet God on his level so that he can see you. And because of your obedience, he can allow the Holy Spirit to protect you against the decisions and the errors that you make. And you have the ability when when disobedience is to a, to its height, when disobedience rises, you have the ability through through the anointed one and his anointing to cast that down and take charge over your thought pattern. You cannot let your mind think anything it wants to. You can't let your mind just drift off anywhere and be a space cadet and thinking about this and thinking about that. The enemy, that's the influence of Satan. It is the devil's workshop. If you're going to meditate, uh, if you're going to visualize and personalize, you got to focus on the things of God. You can't just be sitting there in outer space somewhere because Satan is going to fill your mind. And the mind is the gateway to your spirit. And my God, if it get down in your spirit, uh, if Satan gets in your spirit, if he takes control of you and begin to oppress you and depress you, you are in trouble, honey. Sir, you are in trouble. If you entertain those thoughts of Satan, the battle is in the mind and you got to conquer your mind. You got to have the mind of Christ. You got to walk in obedience because disobedience will activate Satan against your life and gives him authority to do a habit against you. Amen. Authority is like an umbrella. It's a protection for you. And as long as you're under the umbrella, you're protected. But see, when you get out from up under authority, you expose yourself to demonic activity. That's going to be too strong for you to handle. That's why the word of God says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's because the moment you rebel in the mind and take action, you then allow yourself to put yourself in the arms way of Satan. And to your amazement, you can't conquer it. To your amazement, it's, it's too much for you. It's because you're out of the will of God. And you don't know why. But it's like witchcraft working against you. I had a, a story. My mom told me something. Don't do, don't do, don't do. She begged me. She pleaded with me. She said, son, don't do it. And I didn't listen to mom because authority is a protection for you. And as long as you're under the umbrella of that protection and listen to that authority, that's why pastors are important, contrary to what people may think of us. Pastors are important because it's a covering to protect you. All authority, contrary, the police department, no matter what you think of them, they are authority and they're there to protect you, regardless of what the outcome is. And you have to assume that they're there to protect you. You cannot, a moment you see a police officer, feel like you're going to be the next Rodney King. Oh, I'm going back too far now. <laughs> You're going to be the next Floyd or any of the others that, that had some problems with the police department. You can't see it like that because then you open the door for Satan. God has not given us a spirit of fear, the scripture says, but he's given us power, 
love and a sound mind. And the scripture says, perfect love cast out fear. So I didn't listen to mom. I went against her at 18 years old. Because the, the, the uh, United States had, had voted that uh, you were grown at 18 years old. <laughs> that messed me up. So now mom can't tell me nothing. Dad can't tell me nothing. I'm grown. Okay? The law said I'm grown. Well, that proved that to be messed up, bad decision, because now they took it back. And then now they're talking about possibly taking it up to 25. <laughs> because people, it's just talk. <laughs> but it's people who don't understand responsibility, reliability, and dependability. At 18 years old, I thought I, I was all that then, some and some chips and dip and gave a lot of lip. Because I got beside myself. Because now nobody can tell me what to do. I'm grown. So as far as I was concerned, mom, appreciate your advice. Thank you, but no thank you. But mom and dad was my covering. They were my protection. And had I listened to them, I wouldn't have had a lifetime of misery. And that's what happens when we don't listen to the authority that's over us. See, the battle is in the mind because the mind's going to tell you, you know they don't know what they're talking about. They just don't want you to have fun. They couldn't have no parties when they were young. Mama didn't let them go nowhere. They don't know what it is to go to club and have a, a, a blast and fun and juke. They just want to deprive you. But see, what they see is the consequences. Parents see the consequences of your decision. They can see afar off. They can see further than you can. So we have to listen and be under the covering of our authority. Because the battle is in the mind. Satan, who has no power, he will influence you. And peer pressure is on an all-time high. I remember in, in, in Detroit, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and the first time I was introduced to drugs, I thought the guy had lost his mind. One of me ran the man, sniffed some powder. Have you lost your cotton-picking mind? And I said, oh, no, man. Uh-uh. But then as time got on, curiosity killed the cat. But satisfaction brought him back. <laughs> so thanks, what I'm trying to get across to you this morning is the battle of the mind of Satan, our adversary. The, the battle in your thinking and to let you understand that this meaning-making machine in your mind is always creating meaning. And unfortunately, we allow it to put meaning, meaning too much meaning into simple things. We allow it to put too much meaning in things that don't mean nothing. We put too much emphasis and create so much meaning out of nothing. We create fights out of nothing. They stepped on my toe and didn't say thank you. They, 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 they elbowed me the wrong way. And they saw me. Can't say they didn't see me as big as I am. That's what the enemy does speaking to you. He paints pictures. But the scripture is clear that we're to cast down those imaginations. And imaginations is images. That's why pornography is dangerous for young people. Because it's an image that they cannot get out of their mind. And it, and, and it grows and it grows and it grows. And according to the experts, it creates rapists. Because of the images. Because of that image that, that they seen, that they looked at. And they could not fight that. 
And the enemy constantly fed them an image, and that recorder kept going over and over and over in their head. So we have to cast down imaginations. We have to bring things to, to, to ground level when the enemy is showing us different things. And we have to take charge over the things that want to take charge over you. You cannot let things control you. Don't let things dominate you. Satan uses intimidation, manipulation, and domination. Those two, three weapons against you. He intimidates you. You cannot be intimidated by any demon or any devil or nothing to intimidate you. You got to know who you are in God. You got to know what God says about you. You got to know that you created in the image of God, that you look like God, that you favor God. Man, you got to feel good about yourself because the moment you start feeling bad about who you are, the enemy is going to come and paint you some images. And when he come paint you those images, they come, because they come to be a reality in your thinking. And we put meaning into it. We create meaning and meaning and meaning instead of casting it down as the scripture tells us to do. It tells us simply to cast that, those thoughts down. To don't let them take root. Don't let them grow. Don't let them develop. Don't not let them become to fruition. Conquer them. Step, put a stop to them right away. And so in order to do that, you got to cast down and put on the whole armor of God. So Ephesians chapter 6, let's go there quickly. Ephesians chapter 6. So in order to battle the mind, you got to have on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, when you have it, say amen. amen. Let's look at verse... Chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Let's look at it. You have it? Finally, my brothers and my sisters, be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. In your own strength, you're no battle for demonic activity. Number one, you can't see them. Number two, they can become a figment of your imagination. They, they, they can trick you. They can deceive you. So you can't see demons and you can't see devils. But you have to know God's word and walk in power and walk in might. You have to work in, walk in the power of God's might. And how you walk in the power of his might you have a conscious awareness of the presence of Almighty God. You got to have a conscious awareness that God is with you. You got to know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You got to know that God is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? If God is for you, then everybody else might as well be on your side. Everybody else might as well stand with you because of who you are and whose you are. That you're in the image and the likeness of God, man. And so because of that, you walk with God, you commune with him. In other words, you have an intimate relationship with God. And all of hell is backing you up. All of hell is, uh, all of heaven, I mean, is backing you up. All of heaven is supporting you. You got to believe that. And you got to know that God is for you. Listen to me. The children of Israel never made it to the promised land. Their dream didn't come alive. Their dream died in the wilderness along with them. Because they were not convinced that God was for them. You got to be convinced that God is for you. You got to be convinced that God is on your side. You got to be convinced that God's going to see you to your destination and your dreams will be fulfilled. Your vision shall come to pass. 
You got to believe that regardless of what it looks like. Regardless of what you see. You got to be determined in your mind. Paint the visions in your mind. You then put the images out there. I seen myself as a preacher before I started preaching. I said, man, I can do that. That guy looked like he can, he can well away, but I can do it too. <laughs> I saw myself preaching. I saw myself as an itinerary preacher traveling the country. You have to see yourself, paint the images in your mind. You have to see yourself. That's why I ask kids all, all the time, I ask you. If I get a chance to talk to all of you young kids, I'm going to ask you, what you going to be when you grow up? I don't know. What you want to accomplish when you grow up? I don't know. Don't you want to be a fireman? No. Why? They can get burned. <laughs> well, don't you want to get, be a police officer? Oh, no. I heard about them getting killed. Well, what about a doctor? No, I'm scared to operate on people. I'm scared of blood. All these different excuses. They come up with, you have to know where, where you're going in life. Because if you don't know where you're going in life, any road will take you there. You got to know where you're headed, where you're going, what you're going to do, and what you ought to accomplish. So when the thoughts of the enemy come, when the enemy becomes to paint pictures in your mind with us already always listening to the, to the voices and creating meaning that don't have much to do with your success we can cast them down we can put them in their place we can bring them down and put them where they belong okay so it says finally my brother be strong in the Lord and the, and the, and the power of his might what put on the whole armor now you can't just get halfway dressed you got to put on the whole armor especially the helmet because that's the, where he attacks is the mind. And if you have the helmet of salvation, let me read it. So you all know what I'm talking about. For we wrestle, listen, this is clear. This is a no-brainer. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Some of you all need to really get a hold of that. Because your co-worker is not your enemy. Your boss is not your enemy. Your husband is not your enemy. Your wife is not your enemy. Your next door neighbor is not your enemy. Amen. Your enemy is Satan. That's who you are fighting. So it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Here's what we wrestle against. High ranking demons. It says, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. High ranking demons that have an assignment to destroy you. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there are demons that have been assigned to your life. Just like his angels are assigned to your life. And they're battling. And you know what? The good thing about it is they go with the influence of your emotions. What do you mean, preacher? I'm saying so often we confuse the spirit realm. We confuse the spirit realm because we don't know where we're going. We don't know what we are to accomplish. Then the angels have to take over and fight and assume that this is what you want to do. And then when you go left on them, when they thought you were going right, then you're going to confuse them. And Satan has his imps now got you out there where they can have a field day with you because you confuse the spirit realm. Because just as demons are assigned to destroy you, there are angels that are assigned to have your back. There's angels assigned to protect you. There's angels assigned to keep you. The scripture says he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all, all your ways. God will keep you if you want to be kept. But this wishy-washy and having this tormented mind and not sure about what you want to do. I remember a young lady, I was working with the youth, 
And I would never forget this. And uh, I asked him if he wanted to go to Detroit with me to go see my mom and be a part of our missionary program. And he said no. But the moment he seen who was going with me, he wanted to go. And his mama said no, because you said no. Stick to your no. <laughs> she made him stick to his no, and he was by boo-hoo and crying. I want to go with pastor. I want to go with pastor. She said, you should have said you wanted to go when he asked you if you wanted to go. But you said no, now you're going to stick to your no. Good parent. Because decisions you made, you need to stick to your decisions as long as they're godly decisions. And don't let the enemy talk you out of it. The enemy would love to talk you out of your future. You have a dream. You have a vision. You have a goal. He want to talk you out of it. Because the battle is in the mind. He want to talk you out of it. You know you can't do that. What makes you think you could accomplish that? You know, you ain't that bright anyway. <laughs> no, don't let the enemy talk you out of your dreams. Don't let the enemy talk you out your dreams. Know what you're up to and the difference you're out to make. So look what it says. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you'll be able to withstand in your evil day. Having done all the stand, stand therefore. The evil day is when all the demons and devils get together and they say this is the day because they're weak. This is the day because they've been hit with some discouragement. They've now been told that they don't have the finances. This is a day now to launch an attack on them. And they get together and they go, dun, 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 charge. And all of them begin to hit you. But if your mind's made up and your heart is fixed, you're going with Jesus on the way. I believe that long. <laughs> but you're, your mind's got to be made up and your heart's got to be fixed. I love that song that the praise team sings. I am so loud. My mind is made up. Yeah, your mind has to be made up. Settle things. Learn how to settle things. Learn how to make decisions and learn how to settle the decisions. Because if you don't, you're going to create all kind of meaning into something because it's not settled. Because the meaning making machine, the mind, is going to put all kind of meaning in there. And suggestions. And next thing you know, you done got detoured. And next thing you know, you're derailed. And next thing you know, you're off track. And next thing you know, you're in a train wreck. <laughs> So it says, stand therefore, having your lawns girded about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. Because if you're in right standing with God, because that's being in right standing with God, you got to make sure that at all times that you're in right standing with God. Make sure at all times that you're in right standing with him. That is what the breastplate of righteousness is. It's right standing with God, knowing that you're in the right standard and you, you are in good standing with God. Then you can speak and declare and decree. Then you don't confuse the spirit realm. Then you can open up your mouth and decree and declare your victory and your success. Then you can declare and decree what's possible. Then you can declare and, de and decree what you're up to. Then you can decree and declare what you're going to accomplish for kingdom building and no demon can stop you. Because you're in right standing with God. Right standing with God is so powerful. That's having the whole armor of God on right standing with God. And your feet shard with the gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, your, your, your mind is all together and there's peace that passes all understanding. And now wherever you go, you carry peace with you. 
every step you take is peace. Because if every step you take and, and, and you don't have peace, then the enemy can easily slip in and, and move in on you because you don't have peace. And begin to talk to your mind, begin to talk to your thinking. If you don't have the peace, that's why it's important that you have your feet shard with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace is powerful. Peace, peace is, will, will cause you to, to, to have such power with God. It'll be amazing to you. But when you're tormented by demons, tormented by devils, wishy-washy, washy-wishy, you don't know which way is up. You don't know what, the, what decision to make. You're uncertain about everything. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know. Well, what do you know? <laughs> you got to know and have the peace. This will keep the battle of the mind at a place of victory for you when you have peace. Because whenever there's confusion, Satan's the author of confusion, and that's one of his job description, is to get you confused. Get your mind where you all confused. I'm so 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 confused. That's a tactic and a strategy Satan uses against you to confuse you. Because ultimately, he wants to devalue you, make you feel less than. You ain't nobody. You know, who you think you are? You no match for Satan. You no match to live victorious. That's for your mama. That's for your daddy to live victorious. You don't have, I don't have to. You better control your mind. You better control your thought pattern. But most of all, you better have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Let me move right along. I'm out of time, just about out of time. And above all, take the shield of faith. Now, the shield of faith is so powerful because the shield of faith causes you to go after demons and devils, not running from them. The shield of faith causes you to go after the demonic activity that's trying to destroy you. You don't sit back there and be like Superman and just let the bullets bounce off of you. You don't just stand there and say, man, no, you use a shield of faith and you put them demons and devils on the run. You keep them on the run. You keep them running from you with the shield of faith. You keep chasing after them. Because you have the faith. Without faith, the scripture says, it's impossible to please God. But they that come into God must believe that he is and that God is a rewarder to them to diligently seek after him. He's going to reward you for going after him and seeking him. You're going to be blessed and highly favored. Look what it says. Wherefore, I take unto you the shield of faith where you quench all, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. you got to have the word living and abiding in your spirit. So that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will lift up a standard with the word that's inside of you. Because you have put God's word in you. You know his word and you understand his word and you take him at his word and you believe his word. And when you believe his word, take him at his word, it's no devil that confuse you. It's no devil that can take your peace. It's no devil that can rob you. It's no devil that can steal from you. It's no devil that can take you out because you know what the word says about you. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching unto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Saints, the end of the story and the conclusion to the matter is this. 
that you cannot allow the enemy to torment your mind. You have to allow the spirit of God to take residence in your thinking. You have to live in the spirit, walk in the spirit and dwell in the spirit concerning the things of God. You cannot create such meaning from everything. You must, in closing, you must focus on what matters to God. And if it doesn't matter to God, don't let it matter to you. You got to focus on what's important. If you're going to succeed in life and have a successful ministry, have a successful life, if you're going to rise like Letitia Carter and become extraordinary for who's who book, you're going to have to walk in the spirit, be led by the spirit, move in the spirit, dwell in the spirit, and not be tormented by demons and devils. Not listening to the voice in your head. And you got to bring your mind under captivity to the obedience of Christ. Without that, you may never accomplish your goal. You may never succeed if you don't allow your mind to be surrendered to the power and the authority of God. It won't work because you'll go crazy. You'll be a lunatic. You'll be deranged with tormenting spirits. You got to put them in their place because you got to know that you have the mind of Christ. You think like God. You act like God. You respond the way God would respond. Respond. Because he said, I know the thoughts I have towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a bright future. Jeremiah 29 11. If you don't learn nothing else, Learn that scripture so that you will know the thoughts that God has towards you. They're not evil. God is not out to get you. God is not upset with you. God is believing that you're going to succeed. And once you've been born again, once you accept Christ as your personal Savior, that's the prerequisite for all the other blessings. That there opens the door. You are candidate for any blessing that you want in life. Anything you want in life, you ask God for it. And you get a vision for it. And you walk it out. Walk it out day after day after day. And for God's sake, don't change your mind in midstream. Don't get discouraged in midstream. Don't say it's too hard. You were the one said you wanted to do it. God will help you to get it done. If you stay with it. Consistency breaks the resistance. I know that's not a word. But water constant dripping water constantly dripping will put a dent in concrete what are you saying preacher I'm saying get your vision write it down make it plain know what you're going to be know what you're going to accomplish and every single day, stay focused on that dream. Stay focused on that vision. Not one day you don't do something to cultivate and water that vision. And the next thing you know, you'll be them build a successful church. Next thing you know, you'll have a FWC Friends Who Care University. A Friends Who Care Community Development Center, Spanish Department, English Department, French Department, and looking for some Japanese. 
The glory be to God. You'll be a success. So I'm going to admonish you today. Cast down those imaginations. When your thinking is not right, correct it. When it's thinking wrong, make your thinking right. Stand to I want to minister to you this morning on this Pentecost Sunday. This is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is 50 days after Easter, seven weeks. It, it, it's a reminder, Pentecost, of, it's a reminder that God still works miracles today. It's a reminder that God is a God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So I want to minister to you this morning the Holy Spirit and his purpose. I'm not so sure the body of Christ understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit. I'm not so sure that the body of Christ understand the awesomeness and the amazing person that he is and what he does. I'm not so sure that the body of Christ understands how important the Holy Spirit is to their life. The Holy Spirit is, is so awesome, it can be every place, everywhere at the same time. He's part of the Godhead. He's part of the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And so often, we push him to a side and we talk about the man upstairs or we talk about the powers to be but we forget about this awesome Holy Spirit that was given to the church and given to your lives to empower and impact your life now the Jewish people would meet every year they would meet to com comm commemorate the Passover where the death angel had moved across the land and spared their firstborn. As the Pharaoh had had them in captivity and Pastor Moses led them out of captivity. And they remembered when God spared their firstborn. When God instructed Moses to put the blood over the doorpost. In every home that had the blood over the doorpost, when the deaf angel moved across the land, it spared their firstborn. So they would remember the Passover. And also the feast that they would have was called Feast of the Week. And they would, they would come together to celebrate this awesome holiday in gratitude and being appreciative. They, they would come together just to worship and praise and give God glory because of his goodness. And so the prophet Joel had said that God was going to do something extraordinary. Because they had been in captivity. They had been in bondage. They had constantly sinned and turned their back on God. They were constantly doing the things contrary to God. And God was sick and tired of sin. He was sick and tired of them being going against his covenant and his agreement and what he had set for them. They were rebellious. And so he would have to put them in captivity. He would have to put them in bondage again. And so he was sick and tired of having a nation and having a people that was rebellious. And he was sick and tired of having to deal with sin constantly every single day. And so he set it up for them to have once a year the Day of Atonement to get them free. The Day of Atonement was when they would offer a sacrifice, a bull or a goat to the Lord as a sacrifice once a year. And the priest would offer up a sacrifice for himself first and then for the people. And every year as the priest would enter in. He would sacrifice a goat and a bull. It was a bloody mess that he was involved in. But, but God would then 
come down and accept their sacrifice. And when he would accept their sacrifice, their sins were forgiven. And where Tom, Dick, and Harry, and Mary, and Sue were now free, they would say, this is an exciting day. Our sins are forgiven. And then that evening they would sin and they say, oh my God, I got to wait till next year. I got to carry this sin all the way to next year. And the sin would get heavy as life went on, as the, as the year went on. They couldn't wait for the day of atonement. They couldn't wait for that moment again where God would forgive them and dump that load off of them. It was so heavy. It was miserable. Man, they was trying their very best to live life victorious. But the flesh was so strong and the spirit was willing, but the flesh was so weak. It was so weak that they could fall into immorality, into sin, into all kind of things so quickly. And God was frustrated with this year after year after year. So God created his son, Jesus, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. He could be the perfect sacrifice so he didn't have to deal with sin anymore. Once he created his son and his son came and the prophet Joel said that, that God was going to send a revival. And in Acts chapter 2, the words they quote in Acts chapter 2, I don't have time to read it, but in Acts chapter 2, it says when the day of Pentecost had fully come. That was a time where they would come in to celebrate how God had brought them out and spared their firstborn and brought them out of Egypt and brought them out to the promised land. It was a time of celebration, of excitement, and they would get together during this feast. And so God had given the disciples, had given them instructions that I don't want you to be out there celebrating. I don't want you to be barbecuing. I don't want you to be eating no chitlins and all of that good stuff that y'all like to eat. I don't want y'all doing none of that. I want y'all to wait into Jerusalem. And I want you to wait in the upper room until you be endowed with power from on high. And so Joel had talked about this awesome day that the Lord would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And it was prophesied, but year after year, nothing happened. Year after year after year after year after year, nothing happened. But he had given specific instructions to his disciples, his, uh, his leaders, and told them, you don't go out celebrating nothing. Lock yourself up. Get yourself up in that upper room and you stay there. You stay up in that upper room and don't come out of there until you receive the promise. You stay in there and you pray and you work out your difficulties. Work out your problems with each other. Quit arguing at one another and fighting amongst yourself. Who's the greatest? You know Jesus loved me more than you. <laughs> you know he favored me. He just tolerates you. Do you know Jesus just tolerates you? So they had to work all of these issues out to empty themselves of all of that foolishness before they could be empowered from on high. And so often the body of Christ doesn't understand that they have to empty themselves out of all of the junk and the filth and the greed and, the, and all of the different things that, that tie us up. They have to empty themselves so that God, had, that Holy Spirit, can come into their life and live and take residence inside of them to give them power from power on high. The body of Christ doesn't quite understand that the Holy Spirit comes to give them a power. They don't understand that. And the body of Christ has forgotten about the fact of what the church was birthed. I want you to understand today, Pentecost Sunday, that it represents the beginning, the start of the early church. The church was birthed through Pentecost. 
It was birthed through them being in that upper room, being isolated and not out partying and out celebrating and drinking wine and, and all of that stuff that they did during the feast. Pulling themselves away, getting themselves alone with God and being a candidate to receive the fullness of the spirit. So as they were up there working out their difficulties, as they were starting to settle down and let go and let God. I'm sure after about five days, some of them said, forget this. I'm going out and party. I'm going to the feast of the week. Going on for a whole week or however long it's going on. I'm going out there and party. Party. Yeah. So. So after I'm sure five days, a lot of them left. Six days, some more left. Eight days, some, some more left. And it dwindled on down. But those who stayed faithful on the tenth day. The Holy Spirit showed up in that room. The scripture says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one place. They were all in one accord. And suddenly a sound from heaven came in as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the place where they were sitting. And they all were empowered with the Holy Ghost and fire. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God enabled them. Uh, the power of God fell in that place uh, and revolutionized their life. Changed their life. They had an encounter. They had an experience. They had the experience of the experience of the experience. Uh, their life was changed changed. Uh, they were transformed. Uh, now they're anointed and they have been appointed. Now they've been called by God, anointed by God, equipped by God, ready to do the work of God. Now they're changed. They're different. Uh, their attitude is different. They're not arguing amongst themselves. Uh, they're not backbiting amongst themselves. Uh, they're not talking about one another. They're not ridiculing one another. They have united themselves in one accord with one mind with one spirit they had unified themselves for the common call to impact the world with the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ Pentecost is powerful Pentecost is powerful but I think we forget how the early church was started and how it was birthed it was birthed through prayer. It was birthed through getting a hold to the God and letting God work in their life. And I think the church has gotten so busy. As you all know, we got so busy at one time, God said enough is enough. I'm going to allow Satan to put a pandemic on the entire church. I'm shutting all y'all down. Because you hard-headed, stiff-necked, uncircumcised, don't want to serve me, don't want to worship me, don't want to come out to the house of the Lord, not praising me, not being grateful, not being appreciative, arrogant, cocky, stubborn, acting a fool. I done had enough of y'all. And he shut the entire church down. Say, y'all not worshiping nowhere. And if you don't worship at home, you're not going out to the house of God and shut the church down. But there was a group of believers. There was some all over the world that were praying, including Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte. And we were praying, oh God, just give us another chance. God, just forgive us. God, we're sorry for not being what we were supposed to be. As we were supposed to be witnessing, telling folk about Christ. We were supposed to be in the highways and the byways and compelled that your house may be full. Oh God, please forgive us. Please give us another chance. Please wipe our slate clean. Please, God, don't, don't, don't do this to us, God. Don't shut us down 
anymore, God. Give us another chance, God. And God heard our cry. God heard our prayer. And God released an anointing back upon the church. And the church is alive today. And it's time that we honor Pentecost Sunday where God still does miracles. Glory be to God. I'm going to show you how sleep the church has been. And it's time that we wake up. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When you have it, say amen. Now, God... gives his church power. And he gives each one of you a power. Because the scripture says on each one of them set cloven tongues of fire. Which means that God accepted their human sacrifice. On the day of Pentecost they offered up what is called a human sacrifice and Paul says it like this he says that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth and he tells us that we are to be a sacrifice unto God holy and acceptable which is our reasonable worship and he says be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So he tells us. That I'm going to accept your sacrifice. On the day of Pentecost. When the tongues of fire set upon them. He accepted their sacrifice. And there is a time in your life. Where the flame and the fire of God. You remember that day. When you accepted Christ. As your personal savior. And you felt the flame and the fire of God in your life. And you said, God, I'm yours. I confess my sin. I believe that you died. And I believe you rose again. That I might have life. And that I might have it more abundantly. And you accepted the Lord as your personal Savior. And he accepted your sacrifice. And the power of God came upon you. And some of you wanted to run. Some of you wanted to dance. Some of you wanted to shout. Some of you wanted to jump. Some of you just shouted. But God moved in your life uh, and he accepted your sacrifice. He accepted your commitment to him for the glory of God. So that's great and that's wonderful. But let me show you how the church is sleeping and we need to wake up. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You have it say amen. Look what it says in verse 8. Let's start at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit where all. In other words, it's given to you for what? To prosper, the Spirit. It's given to the believer, which is the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says, for to all is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. This comes from the Holy Spirit. Word of wisdom doesn't come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And wisdom is seeing it from God's point of view. See, we are, we're always seeing things from our point of view. What's your view? I'm going to watch the view this week. Did you see the view? Boy, that was some out girl. Child. Boy, did you see him on that view? Boy, he had a crazy view. I didn't like his view. Did you like his view? No, nah, it wasn't too good of you. <laughs> and so it's seeing from God's point of view, wisdom. And the scripture says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask for God. And he'll give it to you freely if you, if you asked him for it. He's not going to hold wisdom from you if you ask him. He just said, ask me for it. And wisdom is asking God to see it from his point of view and not your own. But look what it says about the Holy Spirit. For unto one is given by the, the Spirit the word of wisdom, to, a, to another the word of knowledge. 
That's not operating like it should in the church. We're just getting by. We're just barely making it. Holding on. How you doing, bro? I'm hanging in there. What you been up to? Not much of nothing, bro. What about you? Oh, man, I'm just doing my best to survive one day at a time. But the scripture says that he, the Holy Spirit and his purpose is, number one, to give you wisdom. Number two, to give you knowledge. Number three, to another faith, to give you faith. Verse 9 says, and to another faith by the same spirit. This is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has his job. But some often the body of Christ will not let the Holy Spirit do his job. They want to do everything for the Holy Spirit. They want to run everything. You can tell a church that's ran by man. You can tell a church that's ran by the Holy Spirit. You can tell a church that's, that's ran by the women's committee. <laughs> I thought. You can tell a church that's run by the deacons. But it should be run by the Holy Spirit. See, keep in mind that the word of God says that the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. The natural man can't. Un that you have to be spiritually discerned. To understand the things of the spirit. And you have to ask the Lord to help you and to guide you to a place in your walk with him. That you befriend the Holy Spirit. That you get in relationship with him. That you and the Holy Spirit got a thing going on. You and the Holy Spirit is walking together, talking together, flowing together, moving together. And y'all are together. But look what it says. Not only for wisdom, not only for knowledge, he says, for faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing <laughs> by the same spirit. Did you know the gifts of, of healing is to operate in the body of Christ. All of these gifts by the Holy Spirit. The problem is we think we got to do it. The problem is we think it's on us to do the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit will do the work if you listen. When he speaks and says head out immediately and go to urgent care. There's two people there that's been in an accident. And your very presence alone is going to encourage them. Your presence is going to be a benefit to them. It's when you listen to the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit does the work. And then they can celebrate and say, oh, pastor, thank God we got an awesome pastor that's concerned, that cares, that loves us, that's in our corner, a spiritual dad that shows by action and not just in word. Because uh, James said it like this. You say you got faith. James says uh, you can say you got faith, but I'll show you my faith by my works. My actions are going to demonstrate what I really believe not what I pretend to be I'm not going to be no phony for nobody I'm going to be real and my actions is going to demonstrate that and you don't have to worry about what I say you worry about what I do oh y'all can put those hands together and give God praise actions your actions demonstrate what you really believe they speak for you Man, tell me, I love my wife, Pastor. I love her. Well, man, why you beat her up so bad? She got all them black eyes. Why, why, man, you put her in the hospital, you love her? Pastor, I just, I don't know. Some just get over. Man, that's that devil. That's that demon. That's just demonic activity. You need the Holy Spirit. We cannot operate in this life without the Holy Spirit. You will make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. All the disciples will tell you that. Every last one of them will tell you. 
Peter, for sure. Peter found himself sinking, swearing, and uh, sleeping. When he, when, when he was, before he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he found himself in a negative situation three times. Sleeping, I call it the SSS. Sleeping, swearing, cursing. Man full of faith and power, cursing. I asked him a question, blank, no. <laughs> Man of God, cussing. And when he was supposed to be there for Jesus, you think he was there? No, he was sleeping. And then when he rose up on the boat, because you can't walk by faith if you stay in the boat. You got to get out of the boat to walk by faith. He got out of the boat, walked on faith. Then he dealt with the carnality, the worldliness. And he began to sink. And that's what will happen when you take your eyes off of the Lord. That's what will take. That, that's what that's that's. Um, that's what will happen when you take your eyes off of the Lord. Come on, put those hands together and give God praise. You will sink. You got to keep your eyes on the Lord. The scripture says, look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated in heavenly places. And the scripture says, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities. That's why when, when the enemy comes in like a flood, we look for God to lift up a standard against him. I'm not surprised they walked away from that accident. I'm not surprised at all. I would have been surprised if it was the opposite. Because I know they love God, they're committed to God, they're faithful to God, they love God, and they worship God. Worshippers always run demons away. Worshippers always drive demons. Demons can't stay around folk that worship, but they thought they had an opportunity when they was relaxed in the car. You know, they were chilling, you know, just talking, you know. And they, they said, this is our moment. But the angel stepped in and said, not, not so. I will not allow you to destroy their life and take their life. And the angels stepped in. And as Ver Verdell was talking about it, and, 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 and as um, Vicky was talking about how the car, I mean, they were hit from the, you know, the back and spin around. You know, I mean, that's, that's pretty something when you spin it. Woo! I see it on TV and I go, oh, Jesus. Me and, me and Dr. McDonald was watching one movie. They were spinning around, so in the car with accident. We said, we can't watch no more of this car accident stuff. <laughs> and me and my awesome mom, we were in a car accident, but we were just hit from the back. Boom. But to be spinning around where they knock you, where you're twirling. Man, you know the angels had to be released and get down there and quickly in a hurry. The ministering angels was on the run. The moment they knew the intent of Satan, they took off. <laughs> and that's why you got to be so connected to the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one, the Holy Spirit is the one that is the dispatcher. He dispatched those angels. The Holy Spirit did. He didn't do it himself. That's why I said to you today, be in covenant, be in relationship with him. The Holy Spirit and his purpose. His purpose is to dispatch angels to your life. He got angels. Got, I got henchmen all around me. I, got, I, mean, I, I mean, I got an entourage of protection around me. Because I make sure that I'm in prayer and I make sure that I'm walking with a sensitivity that God is walking with me. Yes. Amen. Yes. I didn't fear nothing when I was in the street. You think I'm going to fear something now I got God? Oh, no. Fear nothing. Because God got me. Doom, 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 doom. 
doom, doom. God got me, doom, 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 doom. God got me doom 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 God got me doom 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 God got me doom doom God got you <laughs> God got you doom 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 God got you Okay let me get let me get let me get get going here I got carried away I get excited when I know God got me doom 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 and I got a little beat to it there Amen Look, so to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same spirit. You have that power when it presents itself. The, but, you know, oftentimes the Holy Spirit will tell you something. You say, oh, I bind you double in the name of Jesus. Uh-uh. And you say, oh, that ain't God. And the Holy Spirit talking to you. Go over there and pray for that person. Because your prayer might not be mine. Your prayer might be the prayer that moves the hand in the heart of God. Mine might not be it. Dr. Bedellas might not be the one that does it. It might be your prayer. It might be the prayer that God is waiting on for this church to be packed out. It could be you that God is waiting on to ask him to fill this place. Ask him to pack this Holy Spirit, do me a favor. Pack my church out. My pastor been praying for a long time, years, for the church to be packed out. Nobody want to worship God. Everybody want to stay home, watch TV, <laughs> watch cars, chill. God, talk to their hearts. Shake them. Make them get up out of their bed and come on to the house of the Lord. You might be the one that moved the hand in the heart of God. The Holy Spirit can use you. But we don't understand this whole thing. And this is what I'm trying to bring present to the body of Christ. Because I don't think the body of Christ understands this. I really don't. Because they don't even talk about healing and, and deliverance and prosperity anymore. And I know, I know it was abused at one time. I know people capital, uh, um, capitalized on it. And, and made it into merchant. I know that. And they used it for the wrong reason. But that doesn't stop you who believe. So look, look what it says. To another, the working of miracles. There are miracles that are available to the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Not by you. This is the benefit package that you get from knowing Christ. Once you accept Christ as your personal savior, the prerequisite for that is knowing Christ. Then the Holy Spirit comes into your life. Then when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he gives you a power. A power. And that is not the power because God is the power, but he gives you a power. And that a power gives you the ability to speak to demons and cast out devils and demonic activity and declare and decree what's possible. Speak those things that be not as though they were and take charge over the things that try to take charge over people. Reminds me of the story when when we came in uh, the church years ago and I, I'm a little confused about some things there. But what I'm not confused about is when that man possessed with a demon came in our church. He came in growling and carrying on. Never will forget him. His name was Monty. And he came in. And when he came in, he came in. And I recognized that demon. And I don't play with demons. I said, bam! I hit him upside his head with, with my anointed hand. Said, in the name of Jesus, that rascal fell to the ground, started squirming like a snake. And Letitia saw it. She grabbed the baby, took off. And she grabbed the baby and pulled the baby because when demons are cast out of one, they jump into somebody else. And Jimmy, he was so afraid of it, he just left. Jimmy ran. <laughs> I can't blame him. He didn't know God. I mean, like, like that, you know. <laughs> this is too scary for Jimmy. Man on the ground. Squirming like a snake, 
foaming at the mouth. I mean, he foaming at the mouth and everything. I think I wanted to run too, but I wouldn't. <laughs> and there was a lady with me, and this is what the confusing part. And I won't mention her name because all of you will know her. But when I step forward, I'm not sure if she stepped forward or I stepped forward. But as we begin to move towards him, as we begin to, to, to move towards him, she moved towards him and was instrumental in assisting me in casting that demon out. And then I began to read scripture with him about Psalms as he laid there calming down because he had just been been throwing up stuff and swarming like a snake and now the Holy Spirit done calmed him down and I'm reading scripture to him and then all of a sudden he opened his eyes he stood up and he said God gonna bless this church <laughs> his name is Monty and he left out of our church delivered but that's what God does. He cast out demons. But, but what's amazing that I don't understand is the lady that assisted me in turn to another religion. Yeah, I was shocked about that. Still kind of confused about that. Because she's seen the hand of God. She's seen the miracle that God did through me. She was instrumental in being a part of it, but yet went to serve other gods. But anyway, God will show me when I get to heaven why she did that. So, so now we see another gift, another the gift of healing by the same spirit. And to another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy. There is a gift of prophecy. And I'm not talking about these jack legs that's just running around saying a bunch of things, opening up their mouth, don't know what they're talking about. I'm talking about being led by the Spirit of God. I'm talking about being anointed by God, God's man or God's woman. Like I'm reminded of David Wilkinson, modern day prophet. Sims of God did not believe in prophets at that time, but they had to take a look at David Wilkinson. David Wilkinson was an extraordinary, amazing prophet in our day. And he prophesied. If you listen to that message he preached on anguish back in the 70s, he told us all about what was going to take place. All of it's happening today. And this was in 1970 that he preached the message. And I said to myself, ain't no way in the world that's going to happen. That is not going to happen. And sure enough, everything that David Wilkerson prophesied in that message, and it's on YouTube, you ought to listen to it. It'll blow you away. It's called Anguish. And he talked about what was to come in America. And every single thing has come to pass. That is a prophet. And God gives, one of you could be a prophet. But see, what happens is you get caught up. And they're thinking you all that and then some, yeah, I'm Prophet Joe Howard. I should not, not strike that from Joe Howard, but I'm mean just saying, because he's an awesome, powerful man of God. So you want to be like him. Saying, I'm, I'm like J Prophet Joe Howard. Or I'm Prophet like, I'm Prophet this and I'm Prophet that. Bragging on who you are. And you don't have to put titles on you. The quality goes in before the name goes on. Ford Motor Company to tell you that. They built a multi-billion dollar company with that saying. When I was a little boy, that was the thing, that commercial just played all that. The quality goes in before the name goes on. Now, they might not have had all that quality like they said, but I mean, because we were always fixed or repaired daily or found on the road dead for it, but... But uh, I think they were prophesying because it's much better to car today. <laughs> To God be the good. And I was building them, so I know if you bought one on Monday or if you bought one on Friday, you got a lemon. Because on Friday we wanted to we had wanted to get out of there. 
So we were throwing them things together, and, and, and then on Monday we had a hangover from all our activities, and we didn't want to be there, and we just half built the car. I'm telling you what I know. So, so, uh, uh, so you who had bought cars back then, you know what I'm talking about. But, but the prophecy. Look, look at here. Prophecy is available for you to prophesy. And I remember the, 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 work, the, the mighty works used to work in our ministry back in the day. Individuals would prophesy. Dr. Bedella and myself. But we learned that that's for the body. The strength. Of, you know, we do our job as ministers. You guys' job are to enter into the spirit. And as the spirit moves, like the praise team does an awesome job when they're Standing up, and today was an exceptionally good job, as they testify. But that should happen in the body of Christ. While, we, while we're having praise and worship, someone should say, Pastor, excuse me, I got, I got, I got a word for the church. I got a word that's going to, now the word has to edify, build up, and encourage. Don't be coming here telling my God going to shut this church down tomorrow. <laughs> God going to shut your mouth right now. <laughs> Interrupt this program to give you a special bulletin from heaven. That's when you're spiritually walking in the spirit. See, the body of Christ is not walking in the spirit like we're supposed to. Too much carnality, too much flesh, too much worldliness. We got to get into the things of the spirit. And walk in the spirit, flow in the spirit, live in the spirit, dwell in the spirit, move in the spirit for the glory of God. All right, I'm, I'm going fast. Okay. To another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits and other diverse kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. That's the gifting that's available by the Holy Spirit and his purpose. This is his purpose. This is the Holy Spirit's purpose right here in your life. And this is not preached. This is not taught. This is not delivered. Today, I'm releasing it to you and telling you this is what is required by the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Verse 11 says, but all these worketh, but all these worketh that one of the same self spirit. In other words, it's the same spirit. It's the same, not a different spirit. It's not one spirit over here is healing. One over here is deliverance. So one over here, it's the same spirit. And that's the Holy Spirit. Bear with me. But all these worketh that one of the same self spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. Are you all listening? As he will. The Holy Spirit is always ready to work. But you got to be willing to let the Holy Spirit work at will. At will. When the Holy Spirit is willing to work, you got to be willing to work the Spirit. At will. Because he will work at will. He's ready now to use you. He's ready to use you today. If you would open up your mouth and let him use you. He will use you. It says to every man severally, severally as he will. In other words, as you are ready. As you have prepared yourself, the Holy Spirit can use you. And the problem with the body of Christ today, we've fallen so far backwards. And we quit moving forward. But today I serve the body of Christ notice. It's time to move forward in the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and clap those hands and give God praise. 
So the Holy Spirit gives you authority, power, and knowledge. Know that, know that, that he gives you authority, power, and knowledge. And I'm going to close with reading this scripture where Dr. Bedella left off with hers last week. <laughs> Go with me if you would, and I'm closing with this. Galatians. Glory be to God. Galatians chapter 5. Closing with this. Verse 22. We're talking about the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Stand to your feet. I want to minister to you this morning the painful side of life. You know, the painful side of life can be devastating. The painful side of life can be a disaster. The painful side of life can overwhelm us. The painful side of life can take us under. The painful side of life is something that we all experience. It's, it's something that we all go through. We all have an experience of a painful side of life. This, we're devastated that it's a memory in our mind of that painful side of life where we were devastated, where we were hurt. Perhaps it was a loved one. Perhaps it was a marriage. Perhaps it was a loss of a, of, of a, of a spouse. Perhaps it was the loss of your house. Perhaps it was the loss of your car that you worshipped or whatever it might have been in your life. You were devastated. So today I want to minister to you on the painful side of life. Because as we look in the word of God, there are individuals who have encountered so much pain. They've gone through trials. They've gone through tests. They've gone through difficulties. They, they, they faced opposition. They faced things that were overwhelming. They faced things that you would think the average person that just quit and throw in the towel. And as you think about yourself, the things that you face, you felt like, I can't succeed. There's no way I can make it. No way I can conquer this. I can't get through this. This is too tough. This is the big one. <laughs> and you feel like there's no way I'm going to be able to get through this mess that I'm in. Yeah. And you say to yourself, it's over. I'm giving up. I'm quitting. I'm, I'm throwing in the towel. The painful side of life has captured you. Yeah. This painful side of life is something that you looked up to, something you idled, something that, that meant the world to you, crashed before your very eyes. And you found yourself in total defeat. You found yourself in a way that you just felt like you can't find your way. Can't find my way. I can't find your way. And you're just stuck like Chuck. No disrespect to Chuck, but you're stuck in the midst of that problem. You're stuck in the midst of that pain. Well, this morning, I want to encourage you that to increase your tolerance to pain. Increase your tolerance because pains will come. The painful side of life you'll face. As long as you're living, you're going to face difficult times. But you have to increase your tolerance to pain. You have to endure. The scripture talks about enduring. Standing steadfast in enduring those things that overwhelm you. Endure those things that try to knock you out and take you out. Stand still and watch the salvation of God. Stand still and trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him, the scripture said, and God will direct your path. 
You got to know that God is with you no matter what you're going through. No matter the painful side of life and how the enemy, our adversary, has, has jumped upon you, jumped on you and beat you down. He's jumped on you and knocked you down. He's jumped on you and kicked you down. And you're so down and out. Huh? But I'm here to declare to you today that you can rise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ stronger than ever. Brush yourself back, uh, brush yourself off and get back in the race. Look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated on the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ, when he was in the midst of his trial in the painful side of life, uh, when he was in the garden, uh, and he was touched uh, in the garden and on his way to the cross. Uh, it was a painful side in his life. Uh, but he saw the cross. Uh, but yet behind the cross uh, and before the cross and beyond the cross, uh, he saw himself uh, seating in heavenly places in Christ. He saw beyond the circumstances. I'm here to declare to you today, uh, you got to see beyond the painful side of life. Uh, you got to have faith uh, and look through the eyes of the Holy Spirit uh, and look through the eyes of God and see beyond your pain uh, because no pain no gain honey see beyond the circumstance rise up strong and mighty uh, and endure the cross uh, endure the pain uh, endure the situation Jesus Christ gave us a good example of how you can endure during hard times uh, that you can endure during difficult times no matter what you're up against uh, no matter matter what you're facing, the tough times of life will come. Uh, tough times don't last, but tough Christians do. Somebody ought to say amen. You may be seated, bless the Lord. Tough times don't last, but tough Christians do. Painful side of life is horrible. Because you're stuck in that pain and, and it hurts so bad. Yes. I'm reminded of David. This says in Psalms 53. David said, my heart is so pained within me. Verse 4. And the terror of death are upon me. Fearlessness and tremble are come upon me. And horror has overwhelmed me. But look what he says. And I said, Oh Lord, if I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Amen. David had problems. David, King Saul was on chasing him and he was running from King Saul because he honored the men of God. He honored King Saul because he was king. And King Saul was jealous of him and wanted to kill him. So he ran from him. And in the, while he was running on the run from him, he faced so many difficulties that was painful. That he felt like if I could just get wings like a dove, I could fly up out of here and I would be at rest. And the painful side of me would leave. The painful side of me would be gone. David and his men went out one day and they went out to fight in the war and hunt. And when they got back home, he found himself homeless. Everything that he had gained, everything that they had accomplished, his wives, his cattle, his wealth, everything he had lost in just a moment of time. And that was a painful side in his life. That was a horrible time in his life when the pain was overwhelming. When he, when he lived in Ziglag and he got back and, and, and they had invaded him. They had invaded and took everything from him. And he was devastated. He lost everything. Can you imagine coming home and your house is burned down? They burned down his whole house and the village. He had nowhere to stay, nowhere to live. That was a painful side in life. And you will experience those painful side of life. Life. But that's what the word of God says to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We must endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Tough times will come. Difficulties will come. 
the pain of life will come, but we have to endure. We have to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We got to have on the whole armor of God that we can stand against demons and devils and demonic activity. We got to be dressed for success, dressed to impress, and dressed better than the rest. We got to be dressed with our armor on. So my God, when the enemy comes in and push that painful side of life on us, we don't wallow and have a pity party like David did. Uh, David began to boo-hoo uh, because the people talked about stoning him. Uh, they talked about killing him. They talked about taking his life. People who he loved. People who he cherished. People who he had done great things for. People who he had taken who were losers. Them rascals were failures. They were losers. They hadn't accomplished anything in life. And he grabs them and mentors them. And he pours into his life uh, them and it made them because David was a warrior. All of us know how he was a warrior. All of us know he was a champion because he took on Goliath. Uh, he said, where is that uncircumcised Philistine giant? Uh, oh, I'm coming and I'm coming in the name of the Lord. Uh, and we all know how he took down that Philistine giant. Uh, we know how he conquered in the midst of, of the facing opposition. And I'm here to tell you today that if you will stand and fight, uh, you will overcome opposition. If you just don't lay down and quit, uh, if you just don't lay down and throw in the towel. Uh, David being hurt. Uh, David being having a painful side of life. Uh, he's having this adversity where the enemy, his adversary has gotten him to a place uh, where he's in total defeat uh, because of the pain. Uh, because of the suffering. Uh, because of the hurt. Uh, people who he loved. Uh, he cared for them. Uh, they turned their back on him. Uh, they turned against him. Uh, having someone turn their back on you. Having someone turn against you in times past. That is the most painful time in life. Uh, but that's not a time to give up. Uh, I want you to know uh, David didn't give up. Uh, David didn't quit. Uh, David didn't throw in the towel. The scripture says that David got a hold of the Lord uh, and sought the Lord and encouraged himself in the Lord uh, during the painful times of life. Uh, you got to encourage yourself in the Lord uh, during the painful times in life. Uh, nobody might be there to encourage you. Your mama might not be there to help you. Your daddy may not be there to help you. Your husband might not be there to help you. Your wife may not be there to help you. Your friends might not be there to help you. Nobody might be there to help you. But I got news for you today. Uh, you can encourage yourself in the Lord. Uh, David gave us a good example on how to encourage yourself in the Lord. David had wept. Uh, the scripture says to he couldn't weep no more. Uh, David began to weep so. Uh, he began to weep. <laughs> he began to weep. <laughs> He began to weep. He began to weep. Oh, the scripture says he wept till he couldn't weep anymore. Then he, David wrung it out. And then he began to wipe again all the tears from his eyes. But he said, how long am I going to stay in this mess? I'm not going to park here. I'm not going to be in neutral here. I'm not going to stand still here. I'm going to move forward in God. I'm going to pursue God and the scripture says that David uh, pursued and said God uh, shall I pursue shall I go after them and recover my stuff I want my wives back I want my house back I want everything back everything all my cattle I want my sheep I want all my goats I want it all back he said shall I pursue in the midst of his pain he, he began to increase his tolerance to pain uh, and he got strong in the Lord uh, he got strengthened in the might uh, and David pursued God and said God shall I go after them or should I just wallow in defeat uh, and keep boohooing and crying uh, and feeling sorry for myself uh, all too often we feel sorry for ourselves uh, and we just begin to love a pity party we begin to enjoy a pity party for oh, me why did this happen to me this shouldn't have happened to me I'm a good person I don't 
bother nobody. I don't mess with nobody. Why is this happening to me? But David wasn't concerned about that at all. He pursued after God and God told David uh, a word from Almighty God. Uh, God told David, you shall recover all. You shall recover all without fail. And David, when he got that word from the Lord, he said, gang, come on, let's get together. I'm paraphrasing now. I'm surmising now. He told the troops, uh, I know without a shadow of a doubt, you guys got confidence in me? Do you have confidence in me? And I'm sure you had some powders and dollars and doing all this. But the majority said, uh, yes, I'm sure. And they got together. And the scripture says uh, that David went forth uh, in obedience to God. Uh, and he recovered all without fail. He got his wives back. Uh, he got his cattle back. Uh, he got his sheep back. Uh, he got all of his wealth back. Because uh, God gave him a word. Uh, I'm here to tell you, in the midst of your storm, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your pain, that's a time to seek God uh, and get a word from God and rise up out of that pain and move forward in the things of God. Rise. Go forth. Possess it. Don't wallow in defeat. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Stand still and hear a word from the Lord. The scripture tells us that we're not just conquerors, but we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And that we can do all things through Christ who will strengthen us. You got to count on God to strengthen you. You got to count on God to build you up where you've been torn down. And strengthen you where you're weak. That's why we come to the house of the Lord. To strengthen ourselves in worship. We don't come to church to solve our problems. But we come to church to keep our problems solved. Because the closer we get to God. It gives us that assurance. It gives us that confidence that we need. That God is for us. And we know here at Freedom Worship Center of Charlotte, if God is for us, everybody else might as well be. Everybody else might as well be. If God is for you, because if God be for you, who in the world can be against you? You and God is the majority. You and God can conquer together. You can do all things through Christ. You can make it happen. You don't have to be one of those that watch things happen or wonder what happened. You can make things happen. By taking action. As long as you're having a pity party and not doing anything, you, it becomes the enemy's workshop. And he begins with us already, always listening to the voices in our head. Tell us, you see what your God did for you now? He's the one caused that pain. Did you know that? Did you know that? Huh? 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 Did you know that? You didn't know that, did you? Well, I'm here to tell you. It's his fault. He's the one that allowed that to happen to you. And you're going to sit up there and worship him and praise him? What is the blank wrong with you? Have you lost your cotton-picking mind? You're crazy to serve a God like that. But if we would stand still and know that he's God and know that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he will honor his word, that he will be there in the midst of the strong storm, but we have to move in faith. We have to move in faith because faith honors God. And God honors faith. If you move in faith with God, God will back you up. Ask Peter. Peter will tell you about it. Peter moved in faith and, and he started moving and he realized the, that uh, God had defied nature. And he said, this is impossible. With the winds blowing and everything. I'm walking on water. This can't be real. And he doubted. And if you doubt, you out. 
You can't doubt when you're in pain. In pain, don't doubt. Increase your tolerance to pain. And then don't doubt. Don't doubt that God is not going to work it out for you. And not going to console you when you lose a loved one. Yes, there's a grieving period. But you can't grieve for the rest of your life. I'm reminded of Pastor Moses. Pastor Moses had took the people so far, but they died in defeat. That whole generation died because they were murmuring and complaining. They couldn't take the pain. They didn't increase their tolerance to pain. And they died in defeat. And Joshua was in part of that generation. But he was a man of faith. And he came, he came, he came to Joshua and said, Joshua, how long are you going to mourn over Pastor Moses? He's dead. He's gone. You rise up in every place that you go. I will be with you. Every place you put your feet upon, I'll be with you. Be of good courage. Fear not. Be not afraid. You shall conquer. You shall move into the land flowing with milk and honey. He promised him. But he, he had to quit grieving over Pastor Moses. And so often we'll lose a loved one and we'll grieve and it'll kill us if we, if we, don't, if we, don't, if we allow it. Grief will kill us. It's a time, death, of course, that's a loss in our life and it's a painful thing. But it, we, life has to go on. You can't be stuck in that grief and that pain the rest of your life. You celebrate the fond moments that you had with them. You celebrate those good times when it's their birthday. You, say, you put on Facebook, happy birthday, mama. <laughs> happy birthday, daddy. Happy birthday, sis. Happy birthday, bro. Or oh, happy birthday, my friend. I miss you. God bless you. Yeah, you, and you reflect on the good times and maybe some of the bad times. But you celebrate those times. And if you lose a house, if you're the, the painful side of being homeless, you come home like David and your house is burned down. You, unfortunately, you didn't have any insurance. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so all you thinking about is, I'm homeless, I can't rebuild. You got to see that God is going to give you a better house than what you had before. You got to believe those things. You got to have the faith to believe that which you can't see. Because faith is certain of things you can't see. You can't see it in the natural, but your faith and your trust in your God and belief is so great. David had an awesome relationship with God. And that's why he could lean to him, even in the midst of his belly aching and crying out, uh, crying half the time during the scripture and belly aching. But when it was all said and done, before that psalm is over, David said something positive about how God had met him in a special way. As he, if you read the Psalms, you'll find where David was complaining about this. How long will my enemies have jurisdiction over me? How long will they have charge over me? How long will they embarrass me? How long this? How long? How long? How long? How long? How long? He was always asking questions. But then because as he began to reflect in his writings, he would talk about how great God was within him. And how God was for him. And how God was on his side. And he would say some very encouraging, inspiring things. And that's what we have to do. Because keep in mind, a negative and a positive equals a positive. But two negatives, you're done. If you're negative, 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 you connect with negative, you are negative, 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 you're negative. But if you're having a difficult time and you connect with a positive... That supersedes the negative. Always, always remember that. That the positive will supersede the negative. 
But you got to reach out for that positive side of God. That, that side of encouragement. That, that side where he's there to make you and mold you. Amen. And for God's sake, know that God's working his divine plan in your life. Amen. That all things work together for good of those who love the Lord. And that is the most difficult thing to see and understand in the midst of your trial. When all hell is breaking loose, you lost everything, the painful side of life, and then you're going to say, it's going to work for my good. Reminds me of my mom when she used to beat the hell out of me. She, she, she used to tell me, I'm, she, she used to tell me, this is for your good. Bam. 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 And I'm saying to myself, how in the world is this for my good? I don't see no good in this. But she beat the hell out of me. Look at me today. <laughs> the hell is gone. <laughs> but the painful side of life. Those were some painful beats nice guy. This generation got it made. Now you better not spank one of them today. Boy, you go to jail. Don't have a mark. That's it. You're under arrest. Boy, my mom, they would have put her under the jail, all them beatings, all them scars I had on me, boy, I'm telling you. Boy, but it worked. Spare the rod, spoil the child. That's what she believed. And she stood on God's word, and it worked for her. I don't know about anybody else, but I know, I know it worked. But as I begin to close, I'm reminded of the painful side of Jesus. The painful side of Jesus when he was on that cross. The painful sign of Jesus and the agony and the pain that he was going through. As those Roman soldiers beat him and, and, and ripped his flesh off of his bones. I don't know if you know this or not. But on the, on the edge of that, or on the end I should say, of that whip. There was metal that was at the end of that whip. And every time that Roman soldier slashed, it ripped his flesh off of his bones. Jesus went through a gruesome, horrible, executional style death. And in that was painful. In that was a disappointment. In that he faced as he was hanging on that cross when God had to separate him God had to separate him himself from his son and Jesus had to separate himself from his father and as he was hanging there he said why hast thou forsaken me why hast thou left me here to go through this painful side of life? To go through this agony and the pain that he had to go through to be the perfect sacrifice. But even in the midst of feeling forsaken and in the pain of going through that gruesome, horrible death on the cross, he was willing to separate himself from his father. And his father separated himself from him. But he yelled out, out of pain and out of agony and out of hurt. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? It was the painful side of his life. The most horrible, horrific pain not only not to be in divine where he could heal himself and heal others lay hands on the sick and they would recover blind eyes open lame walk dead raised he himself now is just a normal human being like you and i the supernatural side is gone and the painful side of reality came. The painful side of life.
But in that, the scripture says that he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He's seen beyond that moment. See, so often we're looking at the moment of pain. But you got to be like Jesus. See beyond that moment of pain. See beyond that hurt. And he saw beyond that moment of pain. As those Roman soldiers had beat him and he's, and he's stretched hand forth and nailed to the cross and, and the spike nailed to his feet and, and taking that spear and shoved it up into his side and as he was dying on the cross what painful side of life did he endure what are you saying preacher I'm saying if Jesus can endure all of that agony all of that pain all of that crucifixion that little trial you go through is nothing. That what you face is not to be compared to the suffering of our Lord and Savior. Because we lose a house, because we lose a car, because we lose material things, because we lose things, we get so bent out of shape. But we haven't lost our life. He had to give up his life. You still have your life. You still have your life. And because you have your life, you have a chance to achieve. You have a chance to put all of that behind you. All your failures, all your mistakes, all your hurts, all your pains. Whatever you faced in life, the painful side of life, you can put that behind you. And you can open up a new chapter for the glory of God. And you can write the book again. And then you can talk about the painful side of life. But you can also talk about the victory side of life. How God transformed you from what you were to where you are now. Because you increased your tolerance to pain. Now you can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The word of God says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's your joy. In the moment the enemy can take your joy, he can take you out. So you got to keep on smiling. Keep on laughing. Keep on being excited about the things of the kingdom. Because it drives demons away from you. But if you are a weakling. And you're down. And I'm going to close with this story. Growing up in the streets of Detroit. I had a name, and it was Random Man. And I was known on the north end side of Detroit. But the pains of life, losing a girlfriend, and losing, just discouraged, just not happy. I end up going in the neck of the woods where my mom lived who knew not Randall Hall Walker, or who knew not Randall, or knew not Rand the man. I went on a different side of town that didn't know me, but I was still operating as Mr. Tough Guy. And I remember they were jumping on a friend of mine. And I ran over there and I said to them young jits, I said, you get off of him right now. They looked at me, just like the seven sons of Skeeter. <laughs> Who is you? 
They left him alone, all right. <laughs> and not only did they turn on me, others came, I don't know where they came from. They got to pouncing and kicking on me and stomping me and stomping me, and it was painful. They got to kicking on me and 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 knocking me down, and and it was it was bad. And I'm like, what's this? And out of the clear blue sky, one of the guys who knew me from his brother ran over there and said, "Y'all get off him." That's random man. <laughs> and pulled them off of me. And even though my ribs was cracked, even though I felt like my shoulder was broke, even though I was hurting everywhere, I got up, pulled up my pants, and I said, yeah, that's right. This is random man. <laughs> What are you saying? I'm saying there's painful times in life that you will face but make good out of the bad times. Don't just settle for bad times. Don't settle and accept what is. That's why I don't like that statement that says it is what it is because that saying is a fixed way of the way it is. I don't like that statement. It is what it is. No. When you say it is what it is, you're saying it's no other way to be. It's a fixed way of viewing things. That's not true. You can change what is to what it needs to be. Stand up. Get your Bibles and turn them, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to give you nine points real quickly, and I'm going to go pretty fast on these. But I want you to get a hold to, to this, the rise and fall of a great nation. And it, it can be the rise and fall of your life as well. I want you to take these principles and build your life and build your faith and strengthen who you are. Because you are a nation. Believe it or not, you are a nation. You are part of a nation, so you're connected to a nation that makes you a baby nation. So, with that, the rise and fall of you. The rise and fall of a great nation. Go with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. And keep in mind, Always understand that sin, disobedience to God, will always be consequences. There's consequences to disobedience. When you disobey God, there's consequences. The children of Israel, when they disobeyed God, they ended up in captivity to the Babylonians. And they were in bondage for years until they repented. Until they got on their knees and said, I'm sorry, God, for serving other gods. I'm sorry for turning my back on you. I'm sorry for not living right. And so often we got a world today that has backslidden. So many have turned their back on God. Preachers walking out of the pulpit saying, I can't do this no more. Because of various reasons, such as the congregation is mean to them. Or the congregation refused to be a blessing to them. Or the congregation uh, makes them angry and upset. And they quit and walk out of the pulpit. They forget who called them. You got to always remember who called you. Who called you to salvation? Who called you to have a relationship with, with God? He called you. Not the people. And I understand people can beat you down. They can be cruel. They can be mean. They can be nasty. And they can cause you a great fall. 
But here today, I want to encourage you. I want to build pastors and leaders in, in, in the body of Christ. I want to build you up because you can rise in power. You don't have to live a defeated life just because everybody else does. <laughs> or a lot of people, I should say. The rise and fall of a great nation. Bondage to a, to a spiritual faith. Bondage slash spiritual faith. Going from bondage to spiritual faith. Look what it says in Galatians chapter 5. It says, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. How dare we get free where God set us free. God took the, took the chains and the bondages, the drugs, the alcohol, the smoking, the illicit sex. He delivered us and set us free. How dare will we go back into bondage and turn our back on God and go backwards? We're always moving forward with God. We're always determined to succeed with God. Because we're grateful. Because we're thankful. Because we're appreciative to what God has done in our life. How dare we go backwards from spiritual faith to bondage? But that is the fall of a great nation that gets puffed up and get all haughty and get, get arrogant and forget about from where they came. Forget about the goodness of God. Forget about how God has delivered them. Forget about God how, how God has set them free. And they go back into bondage and serve other gods and serve other things and put everything ahead of him. They put their car before him. They put their house before them. They put their wives before him. They put their husband before him. You have to put God first in everything you do. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things shall be added unto you the fall of a great nation is going back into bondage where God has set us free go with me if you would to Deuteronomy 31 7 spiritual faith to great courage Deuteronomy chapter 31, you have it, say amen. amen. Let's look at verse 7. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of Israel, be strong and good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which God swore unto his fathers to give them, that thou shalt cause them to inherit it. God gave them the land. He gave them a place flowing with milk and honey. And he charges Joshua to move forth and to go forth in the things of God and build his spiritual faith to great courage. He was building courage in his life. Uh, you have to build courage in your life. You have to be bold. You have to be strong. You have to be determined. When the enemy comes in like a flood, you got to lift up a standard against it and say, I'm going to stand for God. For God I live and for God I die. Pastor Moses spoke into Joshua's life and said, you have a responsibility to take the people into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. What is your responsibility to lead people where they need to grow? We need a nation that's going to rise up uh, and be strong and, and powerful and courageous and not be wimps and jellyback weak folk that can't, take, can't do nothing for the kingdom of God. They sit around and talk junk and talk foolishness. Uh, they don't talk faith talk. Uh, they don't talk those things that be not as though they were. Uh, they don't declare before the world that this God our Lord is coming he's coming and he's coming soon and we got to prepare so we can be a great nation not only is spiritual faith to a great nation to great courage but great courage to liberty go with me if you would to Isaiah 61 1 when you have it, say amen. Isaiah 61. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah says in 61, 1, 
after difficulties and after going through some tough times with the children of Israel. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tithing unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Here Isaiah says, uh, you don't have to live in bondage. Uh, you don't have to live in defeat. Uh, you don't have to let the enemy have you down and out. Uh, you can rise up in the authority of the anointed one and his anointing and break every shackle and break every chain and every demonic force that attacks itself and come at you for the destruction of your life and your family and your church and your home. Uh, you can rise in power as an overcomer and say the spirit of the Lord is a upon me and I'm determined to succeed. Uh, no demon and devil no demonic activity nothing's going to hinder me from my spirituality. Uh, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who will strengthen me as I go and journey to my greatness for the glory of God. Great nation has great people who love the Lord. Great courage to liberty. When you have courage, you have liberty. When you have courage, you have boldness. When you have courage, you have faith. Don't be a wimp. Don't be someone weak. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not in your own strength, but the power of God's might. Get dressed for success. Get dressed to impress. Get dressed better than the rest. Put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against every demon and every demonic activity, every satanic force that comes your way. Know who you are and whose you are. Dr. Burdell alluded to that earlier. We have to know who we are in God. Do you know who you are in God? Will Pastor, I know that I'm saved, but that's about it. I don't know much more about them scriptures and everything, but I do know that I know Jesus. Well, it's, it's not just about knowing Jesus. It's about growing in the things of Jesus. It's about having the mind of Christ. The scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant and came in the likeness of us and being found in fashion as us. He humbled himself and came obedient to death, even the death of the cross. But God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. to the glory of God the Father. Let this mind have the mind of Christ. Have God's mindset. Think like God thinks. Retrain your thinking. Retrain it. You can actually, believe it or not, retrain the way you think. I will pass in my mind just thinks like you really want to think. It's got its own mind. No. You have the power to cast down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, the scripture said. You can bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, the word says. You have to retrain your mind and retrain your thinking. Because as we go through life, the world trains our thinking. They dictate, it, they, they dictate to us what we should think, how we should think, and how we're going to be successful, and how we're going to not be successful. But God is the one who will make you successful if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He'll give you everything you need to do. And give you instructions by the Holy Spirit of what you need to do to fulfill yourself for your God-given assignment and your God-given purpose and your God-given destiny for the glory of God. Liberty 
to abundance. Liberty to abundance. Liberty brings about freedom. Liberty brings about abundance. Go with me if you would to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. When you have it, say amen. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Glory be to God. Let's look what it says. Now we're talking about liberty to abundance, being free. Look what happened when Jehoshaphat was obedient to God. It says in verse 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoils of them after they had defeated the enemy. Of course, they didn't defeat the enemy. The, defeat, the enemy defeated themselves. God was for them. He said, stand still and watch the salvation of God. They stood still, obeyed God. God went before them, confused the enemy. They began to shoot and kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> So when they got there, the enemy was all dead because he told him, so you're not going to have to fight in this battle. And I'm sure I'm sure that was confusing to him. I mean, God, why I got to go? What's the purpose of me going if I'm not going to fight in this battle? But God told him clearly, said, Joshua, you shall not have to fight in this battle. And the scripture says he rolled up early that morning and went out. And when he got there, look what happened. This is the story when he got there. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoils of them that they found amongst them in abundance, both riches with the dead bodies <laughs> and, possess, and, and, and precious jewels, which they stripped off of them more than they could carry away. And they were there three days gathering the spoils. It was so much. He sent him there to get blessed. He didn't have to fight in the battle as God told him, but he had to go get his, his wealth and prosperity. He had to go get his blessing. He had to go get all the wealth and the jewelry, jewelry and the diamonds and all of that from the enemy. And that, that's the reason why God told him to rise up and go. Because he had a blessing for him. Sometimes God will tell us to rise up and go in faith. And you got to be obedient to God. Because God has a blessing for you. Just like he did with Jehoshaphat. Amen. God blessed him with abundance. He had more than enough. So liberty to abundance. In a great nation when we have liberty, it's the abundance. But what happens, the abundance begin to get the best of us. And the things have us rather than we have things. Right. And things begin to take control of our life. And we take our focus off of God and put our eyes on things. Oh. Yes. And things, when we put our eyes on things, God has his way of bringing us down. And that's why a great nation falls. Because they forget where they came from. America forgot where we came from. America forgot how God blessed us because we honored God. For God we trust. Ten commandments on the wall. Prayer in school. Honoring God. Praising God. Now it's against the law. And God is judging America because of us turning our back upon him when he blessed us with such abundance. Glory to God. Thank you for the abundance, God. Abundance to selfishness. Let's go to, let's go to Psalms 52. When you have it, say amen. Psalms 52. Glory to God. Let's look at verse 7. Look what it says. Now we're talking about abundance to selfishness. Lo, 
This is the man that made not God his strength and trusted in the abundance of riches and strengthened his riches, trusted in, let me read that again. Lo, this is a man that made not God, made God his strength. This is a man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Wow. And that's what happens when we get arrogant. You know, how, you know how they say, you show act funny when you get a little money. <laughs> and we can act funny when we get, get a little money, we get big headed. We think we are that. And, and we think that it's us that have accomplished that. But the scripture says it is God who gives us the power to get wealth. Amen. The scripture says. Yes. Oh, Lord. So we go from selfishness to complacency. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we get complacent or we, or, or we just have a tendency to relax. An abundance to selfishness and then selfishness look what we do. look what we have intended to do to become complacent and that means just to oh well whatever it'll be all right God's in control he'll do what he want to do when he want to do it how he want to do it where he want to do it and we just say I'm on set down on the couch and I'm not moving. I'm going to trust God and let God handle my life right here on this sofa. Won't even get up off the sofa to take a shower. Won't move. You know, that problem took place where some of you may not know the scripture that says that if you don't work, you don't eat. That scripture came from them the, the church at Thessalonica had heard that Jesus was coming soon. They said, oh, yeah? <laughs> well, that's wonderful. We'll just sit and wait on it. We ain't going to do no work. We, <laughs> we just going to sit down and just take it easy and do nothing. And Paul had to write to them and say, look, tell them, yes, Jesus is coming soon, but the occupy until he comes. Get busy doing something, working. And if they don't work, don't let them eat. He had to tell them that. Because they said, it was, the mindset, see how people's mindset, Jesus coming soon? Well, then I just might as well just sit on and wait on Jesus and do nothing. So we can get complacent and get stagnant and lazy. So look what it says in First Timothy. Was well, First Corinthians? Glory to God. First Corinthians, chapter five. First Corinthians, chapter five. Yes. You have it. Say Amen. First Corinthians, chapter five. Look what it says. It says it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. In other words, sexual sins. Uh, men with men, women with, men, with women with women, and just having uh, sexual uh, intercourse with someone that's not your spouse, or you're not married to them. So it says, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication is as not so much as named among the Gentiles. It says, in other words, I... The Gentiles not even doing what you got. The unsaved people, y'all call yourself a Christian. Y'all call yourself men and women of God. And y'all doing things that the unsaved people don't even do. Listen what he says. Look what he says. That one should have his father's wife. This guy is going with his stepmother. 
He said, the, the, the ungodly don't even do that. <laughs> he says, and you all puffed up and rather have, have not, and have not rather mourned or cried over the situation or being touched by it. But you are getting puffed up and arrogant about it like it's no big deal. And you are puffed up and have not mourned that he had done this deed might be taken away from among you. That you don't get rid of that rascal and kick that sin out of the camp. Because a little leaven spoileth the whole lump. Or a little sin spoils the whole bunch. The whole church. And one rotten apple will spoil the whole bunch. Try it. Get a rotten apple and put it in with some beautiful red apples. Put that little rascal in there, that little rotten one in there. He'll start rottening all the other apples in there. And this is what Paul said. From selfishness uh, to complacency. They're complacent. Oh, it's okay. If he want to go with his stepmother, it's fine. You know. That's his life. I ain't got nothing to say about it. That's his business. No, Paul says, uh-uh. That's not the way the church operates. Okay, y'all stick with me just a little longer. Let me finish this. Complacent to apathy. Go with me if you would to 1 Timothy. I know you're all getting a little tired now, but give, just bear with me. First Timothy, I want to finish this. I don't want to take this over to next week. First Timothy chapter 4. I'm going quickly, guys. Okay. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, wake up. The uh, pastor's going to finish real soon. Hey, it reminds me of the story. Reminds me of this, this reminds me of the story that um, the pastor was preaching and a guy was sleeping in the back of the church and the pastor from the pulpit yelled back there and said wake that young man up that's sleeping back there and the guy next to him jumped up and said you come back here and wake him up you put him to sleep <laughs> <laughs> Okay, going quickly here. Okay, complacent to empathy. First, uh, for, first Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 14 says, It says, neglect, 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 neglect not the gift that is in thee. All of you have gifts inside of you, know that. Which was given to thee by prophecy and with the laying on of hands and the presbytery. Stir that gift that is in you up. You have a gift inside of you. You got to find your greatness. You got to find your gifts. You got to find your talents by activating them. How do you think an alcoholic finds out he's an alcoholic? He starts drinking and then he realizes that he has alcoholic tendencies. Well, the flip side of that, as you move in faith and do things for God, and as you mobilize yourself to take action, to sing, to praise, to give God glory, and find your talents and find your gifting. Look at Jimmy Carter, has gone through some difficulties in life, but he found his niche, he found his gift, and that gift is rapping, and he's awesome with it, and it's a gift that God gave him, and he stirs it up. I'm here to tell you today, find your gift, don't fall into complaints. Complacency. Don't fall into just doing nothing. Uh, having a pity party. Uh, having an attitude that uh, you don't care. Uh, having an attitude I'm not going to do anything. Uh, I'm just going to sit and do nothing. No, rise up in the name of Jesus and go forth for the glory of God. And stir that gift that is within you up. Uh, stir it inside of you. Uh, let it burn within you. Let it be like fire. Shut up in your bones. Uh, glory be to God. Oh, but here we go. Apathy to moral decay. The fall of a great nation or the fall of you. Apathy to a moral decay. Go with me to Revelations chapter 3. 
Glory to God. Revelations chapter 3, verse 16. You'll find these words. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. God says he would prefer that you was hot or cold. Don't be half-hearted. Whatsoever things you do, do them heartily as unto the Lord. Do it with all your mind, your soul, and your strength. Be determined to succeed. Rise up and be strong and a great courage. And be determined to fulfill your destiny and your goal and your assignment that God placed you on this earth to fulfill. You have an assignment on, on this earth. Uh, you have an appointment with God on this earth. You have a God-given assignment and destiny that God has for your life. And you got to find that destiny. You got to find what you're called and created to do. And be, begin to be active and activate that with inside of you. And be mobilized to go forward and be like that energized bunny. You just keep going and going and you be a trailblazer. You become unstoppable. You don't let nothing stop you. You don't let nothing hinder you. You don't let nothing get in the way. Uh, you're determined to succeed. Uh, you're going to succeed no matter what. Uh, you're determined uh, that you're going to fulfill your destiny and your God-given assignment for God. Uh, and your gift uh, will make room for you. You don't have to make room for the gift. The scripture says that you, the gift will make room for you. You just begin to be that trailblazer and be activated uh, by the power of God. Uh, activated by the Holy Spirit. Activated by the anointing. And God will fulfill your journey to greatness and you won't be a nation that falls in defeat. Amen. Last and I'm done. <clears throat> Moral decay to dependency. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 10. When you have it, say amen. Nehemiah thank you Lord. Nehemiah chapter 4. Glory to God. Verse 10. The scripture says in verse 6. So we built the walls and all the walls were joined together unto the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. They went from moral decay to dependency. And then it says in verse 10, And Judah said, The strength of the bearer's burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so they were not able to, to build the wall. And through that, after the story is, that after they moved in faith, they went to accomplish and fulfill their God-given assignment to build the walls of Jerusalem. And they built the walls of Jerusalem, a nation that had fallen, a nation that was in defeat, but a nation that rose up and lived a prosperous life because they repented, because they got a hold of things of God, and because they had a mind to work, the scripture says. So, so we built the walls and all the walls joined together on the behalf of the people. And for the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to succeed. And when the rubbish got in the way, they strengthened their faith. And they were able to go from a decay to dependency. They didn't say, God, what are we going to do with this rubbish? They were already mobilized with a mind to work. As I close, I want you to build your life up. I want you to become that great nation. Um, I want you to be that great nation. I want you to be that awesome person that God called you to be. 
the rise and fall of a great nation is when we have mixed emotions and undecided about what we want to do in life. Saints, it has to be clear what your assignment and your purpose is in life. You have to know, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? Why was I created? Was I created to have a miserable life, work a nine to five, and be miserable, drag in every day, just hate the job, hate the boss, hate the co-workers? Or was I created to stand out, to be different, to be a voice to the world. Find your purpose. Because if you don't find your purpose, somebody else will give you theirs. And you'll go through life doing someone else's purpose. I'm going to close with this story. My mom, Annie Walker, she just thought the automotive industry was the greatest thing, the greatest place to work. Man, she just loved the automotive industry. Why? Because when my biological dad died when I was two years old, he worked for Ford Motor Company. And she got a big lump sum of money from Ford. So to her, that's the place to work. Security and everything. So I'm 18 years old. Mom wants me to work in the factory. To please my mom, I'm not married, don't have a wife at the time. To please my mom, what do you think I did? I went to the automotive industry, Chrysler, Ford Motor, Chrysler. Well, I'm gonna get to that. I started off at Chrysler. I worked at Chrysler Lynch Road Plant. I hated that job. I thought it was a no-brainer. I thought it was really ludicrous to put them, keep putting bumper tires. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, tightening up bumpers as the car go by. It was a no-brainer. Didn't make sense to me. I'm smarter than that. So, I, so what happened? The station wagon would come by, and when the station wagon would come by, I could get a break if the lens or the bulb in, in, inside was broken, then I didn't have to uh, put the lens on. I could get out of putting the lens on it and I could sit down for a moment. So once in a while, one would be broken so I'd get a break. I said, this is great. Let me make this even better. I'm gonna break the, if each one come by, I'm gonna break the bulb and just set the lens, set the lens on top. And I said, wow, I'm getting break, man. This is now the job is great. Because every time a station wagon comes, I don't have to do no hard work. All I have to do is break the lens, break the uh, bulb, and put the lens on top. Well, the, the, the foreman got suspicious. And so he was peeping over through the hole, over through the and he saw me do it. <laughs> he said, come on, let's go. You're fired. And I got fired. And I wouldn't care. I didn't want to work there no way. But mom wanted me to work there. And I love my mom. I want to make her happy. So, no big deal. Jobs was plentiful. Let me please mom. I'm going to Ford Motor Company. Signed some papers, went to Ford Motor Company, worked there a while. Got sick of that. Okay. Then I, I started pulling stuff there. Ended up, they let me go from there. Then I went to General Motors, Pontiac Motors, Pontiac Ministry. Worked there, all assembly line. I worked for Ford Motor Company. I worked for Chrysler and General Motors. Good money. I mean, they took good care of me. It wasn't no, the money wasn't the issue. It was a job that made no sense. <laughs> all I had to do was put a screw uh, at Pontiac Motors all I did was put a screw in an engine in the engine as it go by <laughs> 
for eight hours? This is ridiculous. This is crazy. So needless to say, I went back to work for Ford Motor Company the second time. So my point is, I was determined to please my mom and make her happy because I love my mom. But that wasn't what God called me to do. I had to find what God called me to do. And my destiny, and I was called and created to preach the gospel. I was called to live for God. I was called to be a man of God, full of faith and power, and preach under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. I found my destiny. I found my purpose. I found my assignment. And I'm more happy today in my life. Uh, God has blessed me tremendously. Gave me an awesome, extraordinary wife, Dr. Bradella Hall Walker. And we've been on our journey since 1980, uh, since 19. Uh, 85 we've been on our journey and our greatness to success we built a church today glory be to God we built a community center for the glory of God and we built a university for the glory of God it is God who will empower your life to take you from a broke down no good person to an awesome extraordinary powerful man or woman of God that you can move into your greatness and become a great nation and be an asset to this world and not a liability. God bless you. Stand to your feet. Today will impact and empower your life and change your life forever. I'm sick and tired of seeing the body of Christ sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of seeing the body of Christ tired and sick. And it's time for a move of God. It's time for us to rise as overcomers and be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and be put on the whole arm of God so we can stand against the demonic activity and all this taking place in our country with the pandemic and the race riots and, and the racism in our cities around, in our inner cities, things are out of control. And I believe the church is the salt of the earth. I believe that we preserve what is. And I believe in my heart that we as the body of Christ have to understand the power of the spoken word. So I want to minister to you today the power of the spoken word because we're so often just talking randomly about this and randomly about that and who shot John and our conversation doesn't have meaning our conversation is all about talking about somebody gossiping backbiting as Christians oh I don't believe that but that's the truth as Christians tearing one another down using our words as a tool against individuals and we're to use our tool as the word of God gives us the tools to speak and declare and keep the devil in his place amen we have the greatest power ever known unto mankind and we've been called by God anointed by God and equipped by God to speak and declare those things that be not as though they were Thank you for my spiritual son, Jimmy, who read the scripture that we have to have faith and we can have whatsoever we say it. Uh, there is power in our language. You know, when the, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all in one accord and suddenly there was a sound from heaven that changed their language. See, we have to change our language. Our language needs to be changed of what we're talking about and what, what we're speaking to others about. If we're going to see a move of God in this end time, we're going to have to change our language. We're going to have to change it, what, we're talk, what we're talking about. Because so often we're just talking about negativity. We're talking about our problems. We focus more on our problems than we do the problem solver who is God. Whatever we're facing... God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his power that's ready, willing, and able to work with you. All you have to do is position yourself 
and speak his word. And so today, I want to minister to you to give you an anointing to begin to declare and decree and speak those things that be not as though they were. Because you don't quite understand. The body of Christ do not understand that we have co-creative power with God. We have co-creative power with God. God created us in his image and his likeness. When he created you, when he made you, he created you in his likeness. And he told you to subdue it, to dominate, to control. You have the ability to control your situation. You have your ability to control others' situation. And what I mean by that is that you can begin to speak and declare and tell the devil to leave your friend alone. You have that power to tell the enemy, I am not going to tolerate you. I'm not going to put up with you, and you're going to leave my friend alone. But see, we're so busy talking about other things that's not glorifying God. So today, this message is to help change your language. I want to change your language and what you're saying and begin to speak those things that declare and decree to build up because we have many many scriptures that talks about how important it is to change our language the word of God is clear that death and life is in the power of the tongue so many Christians quote life and death is in the power of the tongue no honey sir no it says death and life is in the power of the tongue. And so often we are cursing ourselves and don't even know it. Well, I just can't do that. Well, that's just too hard. It's just no way I can do, accomplish that. You know, I don't know why they put more on me than I can handle. You know, this job just more work and more work. I can't do this. I can't. And it's what I can't do instead of talking about what you can do. See, it's not about what you can't do, it's about what you can do. And I'm here to declare to you today, you do what you can do, and God will do what you can't do. It is God who will change the situation. It is God who will step in and show up and show out. But it's in your language of what you're talking and what you're declaring. The scripture says, as my son alluded to earlier, it says that you can have whatsoever thou sayest. Glory be to God. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of... Isaiah, you don't have to turn there. For the sake of time, I'll read it. Listen closely. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but shall establish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereto I send it. Listen, you have power to tear down strongholds and principalities and powers. The scripture says that we are the blessed of the Lord, that we've been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Glory be to God. But our adversary, the devil, who sits in heavenly places, because the scripture says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness. We wrestle against high-ranking demons and devils. But I want you to know that you are a king's kid. I want you to know that you are a high-ranking citizen of the kingdom of God that have power and authority over demonic activity. So you can break through the heavens. You can break through the demonic forces. You can begin to bind and to loose and call those things that be not as though they were rise up in the anointing of God and break through those demonic forces that's hindering you from receiving what God has already blessed to you. The word says that you're already blessed with spiritual blessings in the heavenly place. But uh, you have to get heaven down on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you got to know what heaven looks like. You got to know what the end looks like, but you got to start at the beginning. But you got to have a vision for it, and you got to see it. And once you see it, you got to see the end, but you start at the beginning. And once you start in the beginning, you start moving towards the end. Yes. And allow the Spirit of God to rise up in you and speak and declare what's possible. But so often we're just negative. We're wired that way. We're wired negative. When we come into the world, a kid, he doesn't say, yes, 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 yes. The first thing he says, no, 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 no. 
We're wired that way. And so we have to let the Holy Spirit rewire us. And we wire us to speak negative and positive. Do you listen, listen to most folks' conversation? Just take a moment this week. Because last week, your instructions were to return in the power of the Spirit. How many returned in the power of the Spirit? Most of you. <laughs> listen to what people are saying. Listen to what they're, what they're talking about. Listen to what people, it's mostly negativity. It's mostly doom and gloom and a powder and a doubter and a do without her. Most of, most of their conversation is because they're going by what they see. They're not going by the spoken word. We have to live by the spoken word, what the word of God says. And we got to get heaven, we got to get it down on earth. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven looks great. So we got to walk out heaven down on earth. Because if you don't pass the test here on earth, if you don't master here, when you get to heaven, you're going to school. <laughs> and you're going to have to learn up there. While I'm around the pearly gates and streets of gold celebrating you in class. <laughs> Learning how to, what you should have learned on heaven, uh, should have learned on earth, rather. But you want to learn it now. So I want to encourage you to learn it now, the spoken word. Let me just share with you, as the word of God says, that his word will not return void, but it will accomplish. So you want to be one who declares and decrees. And you want to be one of those that speak those things that are uplifting, because you can have whatsoever thou sayest. You know, so often we, we separate ourselves from the men of God in the Bible. We think that they are our heroes uh, because of their accomplishments. But they were just like us. They were no different than us. They were human beings. But they understood the power of the spoken word. They understood their ability to call forth those things. They understood how to walk and talk and fellowship with God, which the believer today, most of them are so busy on the workforce. Most of our pastors are working, and so they, they don't have time to spend in prayer, and they don't have time to worship the Lord like they, they need to because they're so busy with taking care of their family, and I'm not criticizing that they need to do that. But the body of Christ that God designed to finance his church in tithing, it went bankrupt. <laughs> Some of you will catch that later. But tithing is God's institutional plan to finance his church and his pastors and his leaders so that they don't have to, to work and they don't have to uh, slave out there, but they can spend time in the word so they can speak on your behalf when you get in trouble. When there's an issue, they can rise up in authority and declare and tell the devil, get off on them right now, or I'm coming over there and whoop you. <laughs> they rise up and strong in God, amen, against Satan, amen, and demons. But, but when they were men of God back in the day, when they was hungry, they, they ate. When they had to go to the restroom, they had to go to the restroom just like, like me and you. So they were normal human beings, but they understood something that the body of Christ have not topped, tapped into, and that's understanding the spoken word and the power of declaring and decreeing. Let's look at Isaiah. Rather, let's look rather at, at, at um, Elisha. Let's look at Elisha. Don't turn there. Just listen to me very quick, quickly. I'm going I'm to read something to you. Amen. It says in the book of James, James chapter 5, glory be to God. Verse, uh, let me look at verse, uh, let's look at verse, glory to God. Let's see. Let's look at verse 17. And Elisha was a man subject to like passions as we are. 
<laughs> Let me read that again. Y'all missed that. That's why I wanted you to look, look at me. Elisha was a man subject to like passion as we are. And he earnestly, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Here's a man, normal human being, a man that's just like you and I, a human being, that began to declare, looked up into the heavens and spoke like God did when God spoke to his creation that was created, which was nothing, <laughs> that existed, I should say. He took nothing, God took nothing and created everything. <laughs> The, the, the world was void, Amen. nothing. And he said, let there be. But you fail to realize that you have co-creative power with God. Amen. I'm trying to get this in your spirit, that you have co-creative power with God, yes. that you can declare and decree and speak those things into existence. You ever been just talking negative and so, about something and it happened, you say, oh my God, I wish I hadn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the flip side of that is if you speak and declare something positive into the heavenly realms, like Elisha did, that he spoke that it wouldn't rain for three, in a, for, for three years and six months. That's a long time. But he had such power with the elements that he could declare and decree that he came right back and spoke to the heavens again and declared it to rain. Yeah. And then the, the, when he declared for it to rain, then the earth yielded its fruit. Yeah. In other words, it was prosperous. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying God wish above all that you prosper and be in good health as your soul prospered. So with that, if you get a hold to the spoken word and begin to decree and declare your possibility, where your journey and your greatness of where God wants to take you, if you get a vision for what's possible, what you can create, you then rise up as strong in God and you begin to speak that thing into existence. You begin to tell yourself uh, that I'm going to open up my new boutique. Uh, I'm going to open up my new store. I'm going to open up my university. I'm going to open Open up my thrift store. I'm going to open it up. And you declare and you decree and you become an entrepreneur and don't listen to the naysayers, the doubters and the problems that tell you you can't do it. It's impossible. Why you think like that? Have you lost your mind? You know you're crazy. You know it's impossible. How you going to get the money? How you going to do that? You just begin to speak the spoken word that my God said uh, that he'll supply my need uh, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I'm declaring, declaring, and I'm decreeing that it's mine. Uh, 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 it's mine for the glory of God. Yeah. You know, I talked to uh, what I think inspired this message. You know how Pastor First Lady tell me, you don't have to talk to everybody that you see, but it's just who I am. I have to talk to everybody. But she got a good point. I talked to three people this week. 